The committee will come back to order, and we will now proceed to consideration of Subtitle B. Without objection, the measure will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. At this time, I offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute, which was distributed in advance, along with the green sheet explaining it. Without objection, the amendment is in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read, open for amendment at any point, and considered based text for the purpose of the amendment. Now let me turn to Tom Barthold, who I believe is out there. He's put his hand up, signifying that he is present. It's a long way from where he usually sits here as he gives us advice. He is the Chief of Staff to the Joint Committee on Taxation to provide the technical description of the amendment and the nature of a substitute with an emphasis on the changes made since introduction. I ask that members hold their questions until after Mr. Barthold's presentation. Mr. Barthold. Uh, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee, you have before you two joint committee documents, JCX 35 and JCX 36, which describe the, uh, the underlying provision and the Chairman's Amendment, the nature of a substitute. The Chairman's Amendment, the nature of a substitute, makes uh, five largely clerical changes in the underlying text of the legislation. Let me take uh, two minutes just to highlight the main points in the underlying legislation. The underlying legislation provides that employers must maintain an auto-enrollment plan or facilitate an auto-enrollment arrangement such as an IRA for their employees. Failure of the employer to do so will give rise to an excise tax liability. The auto-enrollment uh, rates are provided at a default of 6% in the employee's first year, 7, 8, 9, up to 10% in the fifth year. These are default rates the employee may elect out of this contribution by an affirmative declination. Most all of uh, existing qualified plans uh, are grandfathered under the proposal, and the proposal does not apply to employers that have been in uh, business for less than two years or employ five or fewer employees. In addition, the proposal before you modifies the existing uh, uh, small employer startup cost credit of present law by providing a new credit of $500 to help in, uh, uh, small employers, small employers being 100, employing 100 individuals or less, uh, start up an auto enrollment plan. Uh, it also makes modifications by increasing the credit amount uh, of the current law uh, startup credit to 100% for very small employers. Those are employers who employ 25 or fewer. And lastly, the proposal makes uh, changes in the present law savers credit. Uh, the credit is made fully refundable and must be paid into, by the uh, Treasury into a Roth account of the taxpayer. The income thresholds for eligible employees to claim this credit uh, for their saving uh, is, in, uh, is increased and indexed under the bill. The credit uh, base or the amount of saving that it qualifies for the credit uh, is reduced to $1,000, but is indexed for the future. And then lastly, and of note, uh, contribution savings put into an ABLE account for uh, disabled individuals, for example, uh, would be a qualifying saving purpose under the legislation. Uh, that includes my uh, brief summary. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the members might have. Thank the gentleman. Are there any questions about the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Uh, the gentleman from Arizona is recognized, Mr. Schweiker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make sure I'm getting a couple things correct. And Mr. Barthold, you can tell me if I'm um, not hitting your area especially. Um, it, this is estimated to have a fiscal cost of what? I thought you guys were. Mr. Schweiker, uh, my colleagues provided our estimates uh, on the very last page of uh, JCX 35, the 10-year uh, tw total we estimate to be $46.75 billion. Yeah. Okay, so um, of the, uh, Ms. Barthold, um, of that, let's call it $47 billion to make our math easy, um, do you have a sense um, what the pay-for me mechanism will be? Uh, the legislation before you uh, provides uh, no revenue raising provisions, no offsets in this legislation, sir. Um, right. Um, okay. Thank you, Ms. Barthel. Mr. Chairman, this is Jody. I have a question. Uh, in no, the, Let me um, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Mr. Barthold, just to rewind the tape and slow it down a little bit, um, uh, you mentioned small businesses uh, currently facing um, a mandate, but I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Do small businesses currently face a federal mandate with respect to creating a retirement plan permanently? Uh, Mr. Ar Arrington, under present law, the decision to create a, a retirement plan uh, is entirely elective to the employer. Okay. Reg so, regardless of size. Okay. All right. So does this, does this bill create a new retirement plan mandate for small businesses? I think I heard the word must, which is the same as shall, which sounds like a federal mandate. So does this okay. bill create a, a retirement plan mandate on small businesses? This, this may seem like a fine distinction. It does not necess, uh, it does, what it requires is that the employer maintain a plan or facilitate uh, an automatic enrollment system. Now this can be achieved, for uh, example, by uh, establishing an automatic deposit into the employee's IRA. So it does not have okay, to be so a formal plan. Okay, so let me just plan. make sure I'm clear. I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me make sure I understand because I don't want to play semantics. I just want a clear answer. Um, and I know you're trying to give me one, but does this bill mandate that small businesses uh, establish by nature of having an automatic enrollment mandate that, uh, uh, that they have uh, some retirement plan or this IRA that you mentioned? If the employer has to, as I noted, establish a plan or facilitate the automatic enrollment, such as I described through, a, uh, through an IRA, if not, the employer would be subject to a penalty uh, uh, tax of uh, basically $10 for each day in a non-compliance period for each uh, qualified employee. Okay. Okay. So if the federal, the federal government's telling the small business that they have to have this plan, a retirement plan or IRA, where there's an automatic enrollment. And if they don't facilitate that, as to use your words, then the federal government's gonna fine them. Um, and that amount is $5,000, you said? No, uh, $10 uh, per day per employee. Oh, I got uh, you. Okay. For a, period, okay, and then, for a period of not more than three months. Okay. So, is the, is the definition of a small business like, like many others, 50 employees or less, or is it 100 or less or 500? What's the definition where you would exempt uh, a small business on account of being too small? Uh, if an employer- in this, in this bill context. In this legislation, if an employer has no more than five employees receiving at least $5,000 in compensation as, as measured in the prior year, uh, that employer is, ex is exempt. Five employees? Uh, yes, sir. Receiving at least $5,000, okay. Did the, did the Affordable a a Care Act include a small employer exemption from the employer mandate to provide health coverage? Uh, and yes, what was did. the threshold uh, for yes, the number did. of employees under that ACA? Yes, it did, Mr. Arrington. It was uh, generally measured at 50 full-time equivalent employees. Okay. The, the revenue cost of this uh, subtitle B, I heard you uh, tell Mr. Schweiker is $47 billion. What was the revenue score associated with the bipartisan Securing a Strong Retirement Act? Um, just a moment. That... Um, uh, we reported that uh, estimate to uh, 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 to the Congress in Joint Committee document JCX 2221. Uh, it had revenue losing provisions and revenue raising uh, provisions. The net effect was a positive uh, uh, revenue raised of 158. Um, million dollars over the 10-year period. That's the net of approximately $27 billion in uh, revenue losing uh, provisions offset by 
approximately $27 billion in revenue raising uh, provisions. Uh, last question. Uh, thanks, thanks, everybody, for your patience. It, it seems like the majority has left some important bipartisan retirement provisions on the cutting room floor, as we say. Does subtitle B facilitate an employer match for student loan payments? A. B. Does subtitle B cover hardship withdrawals for victims of domestic abuse? And C. Does subtitle B include additional catch-up contributions for late career workers? Uh, Mr. Arrington, I believe you're referring to uh, uh, some of the provisions that were in that earlier legislation uh, reported by the yes. committee. And those three provisions are not uh, duplicated or subsumed in the uh, uh, present uh, legislation. Uh, thank last, you, gentlemen. Last one, I promise. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, can I just get this one last one in? If it's more favorable <laughs> than what you've been suggesting, yes. <laughs> does, subtitle B, does subtitle B offer a tax credit for employers that make military spouses eligible for planned benefits? And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging. Thanks. Mr. Barton. Mr. Arrington, uh, the legislation before you today does not include the uh, provision that you just referenced from the prior legislation. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. I yield back. Are there any other questions about the amendment and the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Smith, I should come back to you, and then I'll come back to Mr. Estes. Uh, thank you. Uh, just very briefly, Mr. Barthold, are individuals making $400,000 or less exempted from this provision? Uh, um, Mr. Smith, the, the provision is uh, an, an employer uh, level uh, provision. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the onus of uh, facilitating uh, 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 the plan is on the employer. Uh, there is no exemption for employers other than that defined by uh, size, new startup, uh, and as I uh, noted, uh, existing grandfathered uh, plans, those employers are also generally exempt. So a, a small business owner whose income comes through a, a small business, if their income is, is $400,000 or less, they would still be subject to this, this at, mandate at, and or tax. Mr. Mr. Smith, at, as the business uh, owner, if they otherwise are a business that would be subject to the requirements of uh, this legislation, uh, they would be subject to that tax if they did not come into compliance with providing the uh, uh, auto enrollment plan. Would the president have the executive authority to exempt individuals making less than $400,000 as he has said his plans uh, would, would include? Well, the, the legislation uh, provides uh, facts and circumstances tests under which the uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, uh, may abate uh, any penalties that, uh, that may arise. Um, but I don't, uh, uh, there's not specific provision in the legislation uh, that would say any business owner below certain income levels uh, that their business would be exempt. Okay, thank you, I yield back. Thank you, uh, let me recognize Mr. Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple, couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, the ABLE accounts, uh, although I didn't catch what you said was the impact on ABLE accounts. Uh, under uh, present law savers credit, Mr. Estes, uh, eligible, eligible savings uh, for which a taxpayer may claim the savers credit under present law are contributions into qualified retirement plans or IRAs. The uh, proposal before you in the uh, chairman's mark would say that a contribution into an ABLE account would also uh, make the taxpayer eligible for the saver's credit. So it's an expansion of eligible savings vehicles. Does that also apply for college savings programs under the 529 provision? Uh, not, in, uh, not in the legislation before you, sir. Okay. Uh, just. Bringing closure to one question, as, as uh, Mr. Arrington was asking several questions and they were, they were uh, tied around the mandates and what actually was required, but just make sure it's clear in my mind. So uh, an employer is mandated if they have five employees or more 
that make $5,000 or more, the employer is mandated to pull out 6% of their income and put it into some qualified retirement account, whether they create it themselves or use somewhere else. Let, let, let me refine your, uh, your summary in two ways. It's uh, six employers or more. If you're five or less, you're out. Uh, they're required to establish a plan or facilitate an auto-enrollment plan. The default that the, the default contribution of the employee for this elective salary reduction begins at 6%, but it is elective to the employee. The, uh, among the notice uh, requirements uh, under the legislation, the employer has to tell the employee, here's what we've got going on, here's what the, uh, here's what the de automatic default contribution from your salary will be, and the employee can affirmatively say, no, I do not want to do that. Correct. The employee can opt out. However, the employer is mandated to start that process, and if the employee doesn't opt out, that is a mandate on the employer. That, that's correct, sir. All right, thank you. And, and I would say, um, in reference to the gentleman's legitimate question, as we've worked through issues here, the most important thing we've done is to strengthen automatic enrollment. And we do provide a tax credit to the employer to set up the mechanism whereby the employee would have the opportunity to set aside prescribed numbers of dollars. The problem we have now in America with retirement savings is people at the lower end of the economic spectrum. And the work that this committee has done has been stunning in terms of its achievement, but we still have a ways to go. So I appreciate the, uh, the gentleman's question. Uh, now, I think we are prepared to proceed to allowing members to strike the last word. Mr. Unless Chairman. Mr. Mr. Rice? Yeah, uh, Mr. Barthold, can you describe for me the uh, provision that requires, uh, that mandates that part of the retirement savings be allocated to annuities? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yes, sir. It's um, uh, one of the, uh, one of the new requirements is that a, uh, a retirement, uh, an auto enrollment retirement plan has to offer the uh, uh, employee uh, a, uh, an option to take as an annuity upon retirement up to 50% of the balance in the plan, and the annuity can be either on the employee's uh, life or the employee and a designated survivor. And does that, does that apply to every employer and every employee? Uh, it does not um, apply to uh, grandfathered, uh, uh, grandfathered plans. Uh, so this would be for newly, essentially for newly established plans. So the, the, uh, this provision says that the employer has to offer an annuity for up to half of the plan, so it's not a mandate? The employee doesn't have to take an annuity for half of his no, plan? No, it's, uh, uh, it would be, again, at the election of the, uh, of the employee. Thank you, sir. My uh, additional guess is that uh, credit unions and community bankers and uh, life insurance agents and others will very much like to set up these plans. I think it'll be very helpful because a lot of professional advice will be available as well. Other questions as we proceed? Well, let's proceed to Mr. Smith, you next, okay. So we will now proceed to striking the last word. Does anyone wish to strike the last word? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word on subtitle B. Mr. Smith is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, I uh, need to say that I echo the disappointment of Ranking Member Brady, uh, that our Democrat colleagues have moved to a partisan approach to retirement, an area where this committee has demonstrated a strong long-term track record of bipartisanship. However, at this moment, I'd like to focus on just how onerous uh, the new employer mandate tax our colleagues have proposed will be for the smallest businesses, farms, and ranches across the country. What happens when our Colleagues decide to go it alone on retirement. Main Street gets stuck with an onerous new federal mandate and a tax penalty if they don't comply. It doesn't matter if you make less than $400,000, as we heard earlier. President Biden's pledge to the middle class won't protect farmers, ranchers, and small businesses from this tax hike. 
To be blunt, the auto enrollment mandate in this package, and especially the tax penalty for noncompliance, are so onerous, I find it actually kind of baffling that any of my Democratic colleagues decided to move forward with this subtitle if they actually understand what it does. How will this proposed mandate work? Starting in 2023, every business, large or small, with five or more employees will be required to automatically enroll employees in a Washington-approved retirement plan unless the employee opts out. Any employer who doesn't offer this Washington-approved retirement plan will be subject to a tax penalty of $10 per employee per day for up to 90 days. That's $900 per employee per year. For a small business owner with five employees, even if that small business owner earns less than the $400,000 $400, per year, that's a new tax of $4,500. It doesn't matter if you're still struggling to get back on your feet after the pandemic's effects. Actually, it seems that those who propose this uh, do not take that into consideration. They believe if your small business can't provide its employees a Washington-approved wage, Washington-approved health care, and now apparently Washington-approved fringe benefits, though your small business probably doesn't even deserve to exist. And next week, they'll try to make it even harder for struggling small businesses to provide their employees with Washington-approved pay and benefits with trillions of dollars in additional tax increases. I support our efforts to encourage the expansion of automatic enrollment in Secure 2.0. Taxing small businesses who don't participate is not the way to get there. I yield back. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut to strike the last word, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized. Mm. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, so much for your leadership over these many years to improve retirement security. Uh, we truly have a retirement crisis in this country that's only getting worse. With 10,000 baby boomers retiring a week. And it's even more serious for millennials who are woefully unprepared for the retirement. Come in, North Island Tower. Are we on the same frequency? <laughs> To make my point again, to, uh, to know that 10,000 baby boomers a day are becoming eligible for Social Security, to recognize that millennials are in the position where they need this kind of legislation more than any other generation. The chairman's Secure 1.0, signed into law in last Congress, had laid the groundwork to provide access to private retirement plans. We are expanding on this effort today to ensure that more Americans are ready for retirement by requiring employees that don't currently sponsor a retirement plan to automatically enroll employees in IRAs and 401k type plans. I also want to commend Representative Judy Chu for her leadership on improving the savers credit. The provisions in this bill will help lower, uh, lower income Americans save by making the savers credit refundable so that those who do not owe taxes can receive this benefit and by automatically putting those dollars directly into a retirement account. These provisions uh, combined could total up to seven trillion in additional retirement savings and create 62 million new retirement savers. Congratulations, Mr. Neal, Ms. Chu. Uh, it will help address inequities in the retirement security by helping more low-income workers save for retirements, many of whom are from black and Latino populations. I would also be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to also mention that Social Security is the foundation for retirement savings and other elements of financial security. It already provides more than 64 million Americans with retirement income and benefits for widows and widowers and for dependent children, as well as long-term disability benefits. Unfortunately, Social Security benefits have not kept pace with costs that the seniors in this nation are facing. Congress has that responsibility and hasn't enhanced benefits in more than 50 years. 
We're pleased that we have a president now that recognizes Social Security as a sacred trust. And fellow Democrats have come together to improve benefits and extend solvency, and we'll be introducing a bill soon. At a hearing that we had, I thank our Republican colleagues for their hearing, for their input at the hearing, and I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, to bring the bill to markup in this committee. Thank you, and I yield the remainder, remainder of my time. The gentleman's work on Social Security and defending it is well known to all on this committee. We recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first a State Treasurer and, and uh, now in Congress, I've been a long-time advocate for secure retirement through retirement savings plans, pensions, and Social Security. As we recover from this pandemic, I believe it's vital that we work to help Americans save for retirement. Secure 2.0 had lots of great provisions that did just that, including enhancing 403B plans and matching student loan payments with retirement contributions. I know that there will be bipartisan disappointment that this is, I know that there is bipartisan disappointment that this has not yet been brought to the floor for a vote as it has so much support. Today, as we try and recapture the economic boom that we saw before the pandemic, I worry that many of small businesses who have fought so hard to stay afloat will ultimately fail under the tax and regulatory regime being put on their shoulders by this Democrat majority. A similar provision to this subtitle was extensively negotiated by Ranking Member Brady and Chairman Neal and was included in Secure 2.0. I'm shocked and disappointed that my colleagues across the aisle are willing to throw away months of bipartisan work to force through this partisan political provision for spending 47 and spending $47 billion in the process. The new Democrat auto enrollment provisions undermines what we set out to do in Secure 2.0 and is yet another example of a costly Washington mandate to small businesses. Instead of exploring options to help Americans save without penalizing their employers, this will only make it harder for them to hire. Penalizing employers $10 per day per employee is a very harsh federally mandated penalty. Our focus needs to be on rebuilding the economy in a way we know works. This begins by removing hurdles to new business formation and implementing policies that allow our small businesses to grow. This is vital to our economic success as a nation and there are more than 30 million small businesses in the United States, and nearly half of all Americans are employed by small businesses. Smaller companies make up about 85% of all hiring, making them the first job for most entering the workforce. I oppose any regulation that could harm our small businesses like this. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to stri strike the last one. Gentleman is recognized. I deeply appreciate your leadership over the years in terms of retirement security. This is something that the committee, on a variety of different perspectives, has come together. People care deeply about it because we do have a retirement crisis that is facing millions of Americans. Now, in my state of Oregon, we've moved forward with a plan like this. Uh, it's been in effect for four years. It's wildly popular. Uh, it has generated already $120 million of savings uh, in our little state, and it compounds over time. What you've brought forward with the committee, uh, it looks over a course of trillions of dollars of accumulated savings over the next decade, just when we need it. And I would just say I appreciate the way this is crafted to provide a safe harbor for the 10 states, it's not just Oregon, there are 10 states that have moved along this line, and their programs are going to be protected. And I appreciate the work with Mr. the responses of Mr. Bartow that pointed out that these are not going, that employees are not going to be forced. They are given choices. But the automatic enrollment that deals with the inertia that too many of us have is profound. They can always opt out, but having the automatic opt-in means that far more people, particularly those who need it the most, are going to have it. And you've crafted proposals that will cushion any impact on small businesses going forward in terms of the costs that they have. 
I think it's a good balance. I think it's important for the future of retirement security. And I appreciate the fact that it protects those 10 states that have not waited for the federal government, that have gone forward with the safe harbor provisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina to strike the last word. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, am worried about uh, folks not saving enough for retirement, but I think this is, and, and perhaps there is a, a mechanism, you know, whereby we could do more with uh, businesses that are smaller, but the idea that when we go to businesses that employ six, less than six people is, uh, it, it seems, it seems very intrusive to me. I think that I read a report recently about uh, somebody who wanted to open a lemonade, if a child wanted to open a lemonade stand in New York, they'd have to get 16 different permits to do so. And uh, whereas this, this bill may not apply to a child opening a lemonade stand, it's gonna make it that much harder for somebody to open a small business. I have, I struggle to understand how this would apply to, uh, to temporary businesses and seasonal businesses and people that employ high school students and uh, a, a whole range of details that, you know, if we had the luxury of actual, an actual uh, hearing and, and a debate and, and to, to speak to witnesses and experts about this rather than this, uh, this facade that we're putting up here today, which, which is really not a hearing at all. It's just a uh, 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 sit here and watch the, the folks on the other side ram this through with, with no, even they really don't understand the implications of it because we hadn't had a hearing. So this, this flaw, this process is fatally flawed. The idea that we would, you know, mandate that small businesses provide annuities to their employees is, is seems to me to be a gift to the insurance companies. Uh, it, it once again is the, the <laughs> proposal that Democrats believe that they know better for the American people than the American people know for themselves. And that they're, we're, we're creating here a, a, a bigger government, higher tax nanny state uh, because, because the Democrats believe that the American people are helpless and they can't make decisions on their own. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I where I'm sympathetic to the problem, I am aghast by the process. I am aghast that we would include this in this massive $3.5 trillion tax increase, bloated government explosion that will, through placing additional burden on businesses, through making our country less competitive, it will slow or stifle our economy. And in this, this misguided effort to try to help American workers, what we will do is we will give them less opportunity. These big government programs always have that result. We will give them less opportunity. Their children will have less opportunity. They will have a government that is that much more in debt and over its head and therefore will be less apt and able to respond to future crises and to provide opportunities for children and grandchildren. So uh, where the, un the underlying idea here is, is certainly laudable and understandable, uh, I absolutely cannot support it in this context. And, uh, and perhaps, Mr. Chairman, because this is your uh, bill and you say you've worked on it for all that time and you may have a better understanding. Nobody else in this room has an understanding of all the details of this, a massive bill like this that will apply to almost every business in this country and it will make it that much harder to start a business in this country and it will make this country less competitive in the world. Uh, a bill like this needs to be thoroughly vetted. It needs to have bipartisan agreement and it doesn't need to be included in this massive reconciliation package that will be ran through with no Republican okay, we'll support. Sort of and then her. Okay. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back.
Thank the gentleman. And uh, just in point of reference and history on the committee here, uh, working with the Republican chairman at the time to show how hard some of this has been, we sponsored the legislation that increased the individual's IRA contribution from $2,500 to $5,000. And, and I, it, uh, I will just quote specifically what it was. When the legislation started out, we were in the majority, so it was the Neil Thomas bill. And Republicans won in 94, it became the Thomas Neal bill. But I was only too happy to exceed sponsorship on it because I thought it was reasonable legislation and not whether or not it was a Republican or Democrat. And I hardly think that $46 billion over 10 years is a massive government Pro, uh, program. So with that, let me talk. Uh, let Mr. Me Chairman, if you would yield just. Yes, I will. Yes. yes. And, and I'm not saying that that is a massive government program in itself, but it's included as part of a $3.5 trillion wish list mm -hmm. that uh, will all be bundled together and crammed through. And, we, and I applaud all of our bipartisan efforts. I'm very proud of the SECURE Act and hoped that we would proceed with SECURE uh, two as well. But in lieu of that, we're, we've taken this bipartisan approach with no vetting and no and no uh, hearings, and we're just cramming it through. And I and I, I, I object to it. And it's going to it's going to result in errors. It's going to result in unforeseen consequences, and it will result in it making it harder to do business in this country. I, gar you, I guarantee the gentleman secure 2.0 is getting over the goal line before the end of this year as well. So a person who's had a profound influence on the Savers Credit is Judy Chu. Let me recognize her to strike the last Mr. word. Mr. Chair, I move, I move to strike the last word. The gentle ladies recognized. Today, I offer my support of the retirement subtitle of the Build Back Better Act that will help as many as 63 million Americans begin to save for retirement, generating up to $7.3 trillion in retirement savings for working Americans in a matter of a decade. That is an amazing return on investment for the American people. The combination of an auto enrollment and enhancement to the Savers Credit will turn the credit into a new Savers match and will set so many on a better path to financial security. Some families have much different financial circumstances today that will make it harder to save for retirement than they did two years ago when we passed the SECURE Act. Throughout the course of this once in a generation pandemic, this committee has provided an unprecedented amount of financial relief to families and workers, all while we work to vaccinate the population and rebuild our economy. This includes everything from stimulus checks to enhanced unemployment assistance and even allowing households to tap into their retirement savings accounts without penalties. And yet, some 46 million Americans depleted any emergency savings that they had during the pandemic, despite that unprecedented financial support, indicating just how widespread the economic, economic hardship has been. So it's critical that this committee do everything that it can to help put families back on sound financial footing and make it easier to save for retirement in our Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill. That's why I'm so pleased that updates to the Savers Credit from my bill, H.R. 2913, the Encouraging Americans to Save Act, are included in today's legislation. Currently, the Savers Credit has a tiered structure that only gives taxpayers a portion of their retirement contributions back as a tax credit. But this bill will simplify the credit, making it 50% of any contribution up to $2,000. This means that individuals making under $25,000 or couples making under $50,000 can count on seeing up to $1,000 deposited into their retirement accounts upon filing their taxes each year. And taxpayers with slightly higher incomes will also see a similar benefit. The bill before us today will also ensure that the Savers Credit is deposited directly into a retirement account, acting as a Savers Match, which helps these ta taxpayers grow their retirement savings even more over time. And most importantly, the bill makes the credit fully refundable, so the lowest income taxpayer has an incentive to save for their retirement, regardless if they earn enough money to owe 
taxes to the federal government or not. Contributions to individual retirement accounts, elective deferrals, and voluntary contributions to qualified plans will also be eligible for the savers match. And I'm so happy that we're also making ABLE accounts eligible for the match. ABLE accounts allow individuals with disabilities to save without jeopardizing their disability benefits. And as I work with Congress members Cardenas and McMorris Rogers on expanding the age limitation for ABLE accounts, I'm pleased we could make this change today for current ABLE account holders. So Mr. Chair, thank you for your leadership to ensure that as we build back better, we create opportunities to support the financial well-being of even more working class families in their retirement years. I also want to extend my thanks to Congress members Sewell and Panetta for supporting the Encouraging Americans to Save Act and I look forward to continuing to work with them to expand Savers Match to even more working families upon enactment of these initial changes. I urge support of this subtitle and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Brady. I really appreciated the opportunity this year to be able to join my colleagues across the aisle to support a bipartisan plan to fix the many problems in our nation's retirement system and their plans with the SECURE 2.0. I was really disheartened to learn that the majority decided to walk away from the table after over a year of negotiations and progress. I'm concerned about this new plan that we're debating. Um, you know, West Virginia, 95% of their businesses are small businesses. And I think we just will be putting great burdens on our nation's small businesses. I know a person in my town who has a cleaning service. And this person sometimes has three people working, sometimes six or seven, depending upon their lives and their needs and her work that she has. And so, how would this person be able to handle an additional burden on a business that they're just trying to survive, particularly now um, that we are recovering from COVID? Because of course, when you have a cleaning service, there are people that don't want you in their houses during the pandemic. And so then if they get new people to work for them and fill in places, and then all of a sudden, the old clients want you back. It just, it's one more burden on someone trying to make ends meet. And so I just want to urge my colleagues to return back to negotiating with us and work in a bipartisan manner that will really create meaningful change without stifling our Main Street businesses and our, our small businesses in particular. And I just want to thank you, and I yield back my time. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, thank you. We have a two-part problem for employee-sponsored retirement plans. On the one hand, nearly 55 million Americans work for an employer that do not offer a retirement plan, which dramatically decreases the likelihood that employees will have the opportunity to contribute to a retirement account. As a result, nearly one third of Americans have no retirement savings at all. That means employees must delay retirement indefinitely or else risk a financially unstable retirement. This is an untenable and an unfair choice. On the other hand, I've also run a small business. I know how difficult it can be for employers making choices that ensure the well being of their employees, from salary to health insurance to leave and retirement planning. Money is tight, and unfortunately, retirement is too often left out. The automatic IRA provisions included in this package are a solution to both the problem of employee security and employer complexity. Employees can now smartly save for the retirement by putting away a small portion of their paycheck each month into secure accounts. Employers now have one last decision to make and receive a tax credit for their administrative costs. This, I believe, is a win-win for both sides. I'm proud that our committee has prioritized retirement savings over the last two Congresses. From Secure 1.0, to secure 2.0, and today with automatic IRAs and savers credits. 
These pieces of legislation will dramatically expand retirement savings across the country. And I look forward to continuing this work as we move ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I don't have any other requests here. Strike the last word. So we are prepared to move to the amendment process and raise the question, are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of the substitute? If there are no amendments, we will turn to the report section. And Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the desk. Oh. You almost got that done, buddy. Chairman, well, I, I have an amendment at the desk. Sorry about that. I was thoughtful. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Good. Good. Okay. So let me Good. recognize the ranking member to offer an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the whole country is watching what we do today. We proved in May, just under 130 days ago, we can work together to solve our nation's problems. We put aside our partisan differences and voted unanimously to expand auto enrollment and retirement plans, requiring every new plan formed enroll new employees automatically in a retirement plan while giving them the option to set their own contribution levels. Experts have said this policy works. It would expand coverage to hundreds of thousands of Americans who'd be more likely to save for retirement. AARP support it, as did the American Retirement Association. Yeah, let them know I've got to remember. That again was why it was disappointing that the majority decided to take a partisan approach today, abandoning the careful compromise we all agreed to and threatening future work on retirement. Double, but it's not only checking. the chairman's priorities that were included in Secure 2.0, priorities of nearly every member of this committee who contributed to one of the bipartisan bills we packaged together to form the Securing a Strong Retirement Act. Our bill would have, our bipartisan bill would have expanded saving opportunities hundreds of thousands of Americans by encouraging employers to offer plans voluntarily helping them match those plans. It would allow older Americans to build more savings as they near retirement and help them avoid the traps of the unwary that often result in more taxes and less savings. Uh, uh, almost worse, though, I think, as we look at this partisan approach, I think the bill would impose nearly unlimited fiduciary liability on businesses as small as six employees who are not well advised. I think this is the wrong approach to expanding retirement savings and it will have many unintended consequences, including reducing job opportunities for low-income, young workers, minorities, who are more likely to work for a small business. We do know and do agree over 200 million Americans live in households that have a defined contribution plan or an IRA. We do agree together this retirement system is critical to the health of our economy and future generations. This amendment simply replaces partisan language in this bill and substitutes the entire Secure 2.0 voted unanimously out of this committee about 130 days ago. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California insist upon his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. For one moment.
he's going to. Who's going to do it? I can I can talk about this. Oh, okay. Is Danielle ready to put the green light over here? <laughs> I know you could tell you were really into it. <laughs> well, it depends on what it's about. Yeah, of course. So we'll let you know first before we try to do anything. Okay. Yeah. Do you need anything? Are you hungry at all? No. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> it's probably getting late in Georgia right now. It is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will keep you updated on anything and we'll let you know. Yeah, of course. Let me know if you need more Thank coffee. You. <laughs> Where'd everybody go? Where'd everybody go?
Mr. Chairman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, the ranking member, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're in discussions on germanius. So I want to make sure it uh, fits the rules and process of the committee at this time. I withdraw that amendment. I thank the gentleman. Are there any other amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Buchanan. Yeah, Buchanan. Mr. Buchanan has an amendment. The gentleman is recognized to speak at his amendment. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson reserves a point of order. And while we pass out the amendment, then we will come to the gentleman from Florida. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to speak on his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know that over the years I've served on the committee, I think this has probably, probably been for you the issue that you're most passionate about. You put a lot of work into it. And of course, our leader has, has done that as well. So like a lot of us, it's been said that well, I'm disappointed that we couldn't find a way to work this together. Uh, my amendment, I think, will make a big difference. I've served for many years on the local chamber with 2,600 members in a smaller community, state chamber and federal chamber. There's three things. I'm gonna read the, my points here, but before I get into that, here's what we're talking about. Mandates, tax penalties, and then we're talking about six employees or more. Um, it's gonna save you a lot of heartache if we go down this road for a guy that understands probably as much as anybody small business and a lot of businesses that have six employees or eight, they're struggling, they're just barely hanging on. American small businesses have been among the hardest hit by global pandemic and many are still struggling today. In July last year, 43% of small businesses had had to temporarily close across the country. 60% of the businesses that closed did not reopen. And halfway through this year, 64% of small businesses are concerned about the impact of COVID on their business. The last thing we need to do is a new mandate from Washington. The committee has already done bipartisan work to expand auto enrollment while protecting small business. As ranking member uh, Brady said, we all vote unanimously to approve this bill. Yet Democrats, Democrats have reversed course. Their partisan proposal would create a new mandate for employers with as few as six employees and a tax penalty if they don't comply. It seems to me a little bit like deja vu, but uh, this creates headaches and a new cost for Main Street and these employers don't have the same resources as bigger companies do. My, my amendment is very simple. It protects every employer in America who has 50 or fewer employees. I think that's where we need to start today. It also protects and supports minorities, women and veterans owned businesses as a carve out. If Democrats are now rejecting the bipartisan policy they voted to approve earlier this year, the least we can do to protect American small business is from this new mandate. I urge adoption on this amendment and I yield back. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard on the gentleman's amendment? The gentleman from Philadelphia, Mr. Evans is recognized to speak on the amendment. Mr. Speaker, um, I certainly understand what the gentleman is attempting to do. However, nearly half of American private sector employees, roughly 55 million, work for an employer that does not offer a retirement plan. Latino, Asian, black populations are less likely to have access to work-sponsored retirement plans. More than 52% of black Americans and more than two thirds, 68% of Latino lack the opportunity to save in the workplace retirement plan. 
compared to 40% 40, 40 of white Americans. As a result, 56% of black families and two-thirds of Latinos have zero retirement saving compared with about a third of white families. These numbers have ballooned for four years. So we're going to address the coverage gap, which must ensure that most American workers have an opportunity to save for retirement at work. We need to require employees to facilitate an automatic enrollment in RA for employees. We certainly are sensitive to making it easy as possible for small employers. We are carved out by the small employers and for those in business for less than two years. The proposal includes in a tax credit that will cover any cost to the employers. There's no requirement for the employer contribution. The reality is this. It will be easier for the employee to set up. It won't require much more than that. But what we want to provide is saving opportunity to as many employees as possible and having a retirement plan at work to require purpose of financial security requirement. I also want to again point to the results of this legislation for stagnant. It's important to understand, Mr. Chairman, as you have taken up this space, and I've been strongly supportive of you since I've been on this committee to recognize the importance. So I think uh, what the gentleman has offered, Mr. J uh, would be not proper in, in this particular case would not be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Rice wishes to be heard. Uh, I, I just wanted to re respond to the gentleman from Philadelphia there. You know, to say that people are not, they don't have access to retirement plans is just not true. I mean, uh, anybody can contribute to an IRA up to $6,000, up to 100% of their earnings. Anybody can do that right now without putting mandates on small businesses. You know, you say, well, it's not much of a burden. Well, it's not much of a burden that you have to go to a lawyer and file articles of organization for a LLC or articles of incorporation for a corporation. It's not much of a burden that you have to file an SS4 with the IRS or a S election with the IRS if you have an S corporation. It's not much of a burden that you have to spend hours and hours and hours filing your income taxes every year. It's not much of a burden that you have to do 1099s to anybody you pay $600 or more to and W-2s and payroll taxes and payroll returns. It's not much of a burden that you have to hire CPAs and, and uh, uh, lawyers to do all this for you. It's not much of a burden now that you're going to want them to go and, and hire other lawyers or other accountants to do retirement plans for you. It's not much of a burden that you're going to have now under this terms of this to deal with insurance companies to uh, require that they offer annuities as an option and to take on the liability of that and to pay the premiums, exorbitant premiums for these annuities. Uh, you know, it sounds great if you're talking about a law firm that employs 25 people or 50 people. It sounds great if you're talking about uh, uh, a firm that has 100 employees and the tools to do this. But what you're talking about here with these firms that employ five people. You're talking about landscapers. You're talking about plumbers. You're talking about restaurateurs. You're talking about the fabric of America that really has no expertise in this, no idea how to do all this, and you're compounding the effort. You're compounding the detail, you're compounding the cost of the professional services, you're compounding the regulatory burden, you're compounding the difficulty that these people with no expertise who have a terrible, you know, who have a, uh, they want to be entrepreneurs, they, they're excited about the chance to open a new business, but then they face this daunting task of jumping through all these big government requirements that come out of Washington every year. 
And this $3.5 trillion bill, of which what we're talking about here is just one small part, is going to exponentiate the problems that these people face when, in truth, everybody has access to a retirement plan. It's just whether they choose to accept it or not. Everybody can contribute up to 100% of their earnings, up to $6,000 a year into an IRA and get a deduction for that. So I just don't believe that the burden that we're placing on small entrepreneurs with no expertise in this, uh, I, I'm just not sure that it justifies uh, uh, what we're going to get out of this, which is only what we're going to get out of this, is uh, uh, optional uh, uh, auto enrollment that they can opt out of anyway. I'm not sure that the burden we're placing on these small businesses is enough. Now, maybe when our next panel of witnesses comes up, where we can ask some of the experts about whether what they think about the burden and how it's going to affect uh, uh, the formation of small businesses. Maybe we can ask, is the NFIB coming up in the witness panel next, Mr. Chairman? Maybe we can ask them about what they believe is going to be the cost in terms of, our, uh, of the economy uh, in adopting this. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, let me go to Mr. Thompson. Does the gentleman insist Thank on the point Mr. of order? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, withdraw my point of order. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on uh, Mr. Buchanan's amendment? Hearing none, questions on Mr. Buchanan's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded, for a recorded vote. vote. Mr. Brady and Mr. Buchanan have both requested a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett. Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore? Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Boyle votes Mr. no. Mr. Schneider? Uh, Mr. Schneider votes no, and I can hear Mr. Boyle S saying no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez? Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed votes aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? 
Mr. Schweiker votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson? Mr. Estes? Estes votes yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Would the clerk report the tally? Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 18 ayes. There being 25 noes and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Is there anybody else who would like to be recognized? I believe Mr. Brady or Mr. Rice, Mr. Rice is recognized on, to offer his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thompson, I have an Mr. amendment. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order. And Mr. Rice will pass out your amendment. You'll be recognized. The gentleman is recognized to speak upon his amendment. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, this, uh, this amendment adds to what I was referring to earlier about the additional burden that this places on small businesses. And the gentleman from Philadelphia said earlier that this is not much of an amendment, but my friends, we have to think about the cumulative amendment, uh, uh, the cumulative burden that we're placing on small businesses here. I mean, it would be one thing if we're talking about a law firm that employs 50 people or, or a tech firm that employs 5,000, but here we're talking about employers that employ six or fewer people, or excuse me, five or more people. And what we're talking about here is landscapers and plumbers and electricians and, and folks who have no expertise in complying with these governmental regulations. And before this, before we ever get to what we're talking about here with them having to offer retirement plans or face a new penalty, a, a $900 per worker per year uh, penalty if they don't offer this retirement plan, uh, and meet the, all these government, uh, big government specified requirements, uh, before we ever get to that, they have to go to a lawyer and set up a company. They have to do articles of organization. They have to file, they have to pay a filing tax. They have to file with their State Department of Revenue. They have to file with the IRS. They have to get a employer ID number. They have to set up a bank account and bring their employer ID number. They have to uh, set up a payroll account. They have to, they have to file pay, quarterly payroll tax returns. They have to file annual income tax returns. They have to do all these things under which they, in which they have no expertise. And it's already a big enough burden for people who are excited about being entrepreneurs and building the American economy and trying to get the American dream. But then they have to face all these legal hurdles and it's almost too much. And again, here, the idea of this, this proposal, this bill is good. You know, we want everybody to have access to retirement plans, but they have it already. 
Anybody can give up to $6,000 a year to an IRA today, today, up to 100% of their income. And we're really not adding very much by passing this bill other than making it a little bit harder for them not to contribute. But they still can opt out. So anyway, under this amendment, this would strike the requirement that the retirement plans offer an annuity. You see, under this new government, big government mandated specific retirement plan that, that your plumber now is gonna have to offer and your landscaper is gonna have to offer to his employees, he's gonna have to have, offer an option that, that they can put up to half their money into an annuity. Well, annuities are notoriously the, the commissions are notoriously expensive. Insurance agents love to sell you an annuity because they, they collect a huge, huge premium, a huge commission. And annuities are for some people, but they're not for most people. And, and if you die early, you know, if you're sick and you die early, then that annuity, you lose that there's big cost with annuities. And, and employers, if they put an annuity in place, if the insurance company goes broke, which happens, then the employer can be liable for that. They don't provide any liability protection in making this annuity a, a requirement. So it's just one more burden that small businesses face on top of the huge pile that we've already placed on them here in Washington. So I would, this amendment would strike this onerous provision. It would no longer require that these, these small five-person retirement plans offer annuities for up to half of their investment. This is a massive giveaway to the insurance industry at the expense of thousands of small businesses, and it makes it just that much harder. You know, maybe you're right that this is just a, a, a small amount of burden. But when you look at all the other burdens that these people face when they set up their business, the daunting task of setting up their business, and the compliance that they have to deal with every year, every month, every week, it's amazing that any small business gets off the ground. And my friends, if you adopt this bill, you're making it just that much harder. You're saying that, you know, you want everybody to have access to retirement plans. They already have access to retirement plans in the form of annuity. And for what you're getting here, the additional benefit that you get, it is not worth the additional burden you're placing on the small business owner. It is, it is going to make it just that much harder. You're working really hard to stifle our economy. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. I, I oppose the amendment. I think that the point of disagreement we have here is not on the intent of what we're trying to do. It's over the, some of the specifics. And my uh, belief here is that we're not trying to put an undue burden on the small employer as much as we're trying to help the employee who works for the small employer set the course for a lifetime of retirement savings. And I stick to the opinion that I offered earlier that there will be a great deal of energy and enthusiasm from community bankers, credit unions, and insurance agents to sell and manage these plans. So with that, I would urge a no vote on the gentleman's amendment. Yes. Mr. Kelly, the gentleman is recognized from Pennsylvania. I, I understand what the intent is. But there's such a disconnect, and this is not directed at anybody, know, okay? I this know. is just the facts, the way it is. When you are a small businessman, your cost of operation is very difficult to begin with. We already have an, an auto enrollment program called Social Security. A 6.2% match by both the employer and the employee up to, 100, I think it's $142,800 right now. Each one of these mandates that we impose on people creates an additional cost of being in business. And at some point, the burden gets there to which it's like, I don't know why I do this anymore. I don't know why I get up every day, put in my time, and if, and really, I, 
People talk about working half days. In small business, you do work half days if you're lucky. And that's 12 hours, by the way. It's not four hours. There's 24 hours in the day. And for most small business people, it takes 24 hours a day to do this. Plus living it, even if you're not at your shop or at your business, you take it home with you. It's in your head all day long. I know these things are well intended. But we are making it so hard for the people that provide the revenue to run this incredible government and thinking, well, it's only going to be a little bit more. It's only going to be a little bit more. It's only going to be a little bit more. I got to tell you from somebody whose family started a small business in 1953 and have many times dodged a bullet and didn't go out of business, but it's the surviving those times that makes you more aware of when you were careless, when things were good. I just have been not surprised, but I think more, I have more of an insight into this, I really do believe, and I don't, and again, please, I don't want any of our friends on either side to take this, take this uh, as a criticism. I really wish all of us who have come and served in this wonderful government had been in private business for himself or herself and had to go through payrolls when you had enough money most times to pay your your staff, but sometimes not enough to pay yourself, uh, had worked on a commission-only basis in order to get a paycheck, and had lost your job at least once to know how valuable a job is. I, I, I don't want to be critical of, of us as a body because I think we're trying to do the right thing. I just think that sometimes we don't know how difficult it is, and when we put mandates on people, all we've done is increase their cost of business, and at some point, uh, you know the old story, it says don't worry about the mule, just load the wagon. I think in many cases right now, the mule's going to find a way to unhook itself and stop tugging the wagon. I, I think it's all well intended, but I got to tell you, gang, the more burden we put on people, the harder it is for them to make a living, the harder it is uh, to, to be profitable. And in my world, the only time I ever paid taxes, and there were several world, uh, years I didn't pay any tax, it wasn't because it was a tax sheet, it's just because we didn't make any money that year. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me yield to Mr. Rice to close. Mr. Rice. Mr. Chairman, I, I do want to be critical of us as a body. Uh, this, I, I'm sorry, you are a good man, and, and I know you're trying to do the right thing here, but uh, we're, we're absolutely flying blind on these provisions. I mean, I'd love to have a panel of witnesses here to, a, to ask them I'd love to have a couple of landscapers up here, maybe a couple of, uh, of, uh, d uh, of uh, uh, plumbers, a couple of electricians to ask them how they felt about this burden, how they would feel about dealing with insurance companies and, and working out annuities uh, for their retirement plans that they're suddenly gonna have to offer. I'd love to hear from uh, uh, employees about how they felt about having these, uh, these mandatory withdrawals that they have to opt out of. I, I'd love to hear from uh, the NF, NFIB and from the AICPA and from others about an economist about how they felt this extra burden would affect small businesses and how much the, the loss of opportunity for, uh, for Americans and their children and grandchildren, uh, what the cost of that would be versus the very small marginal benefit that we get from this bill. Because anybody who wants to right now can contribute up to $6,000 to, to an IRA, up to 100% of their pay. So we get a, it, it's not that these people can't contribute, this is just a little more push for them to contribute that they can opt out of. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to talk to experts, I'd like to talk to business people about how this affects them. But Mr. Chairman, we haven't been afforded that opportunity. We didn't even see this final version of this bill until two days ago. I, I mean, I, probably nobody in this room, maybe except you, has read it. We don't know, we don't know what the effects of this are gonna be. I can tell you that the burden for small businesses is gonna be just one more thing that's gonna push thousands of small businesses out of creation or out of business every single year. And we're going into this blind, we're going into this unprepared. It is, it is an awful shame 
that we would do this to entrepreneurs and business owners without the benefit of hearings and vetting and understanding what the effect of it would be. And Mr. Chairman, I, I would request that you withdraw this until we can have, until we can be educated about what we're voting on here rather than just doing it because uh, Speaker Pelosi gives us a deadline. And with that, I yield back. Uh, the, the gentleman should be assured that Speaker Pelosi did not give me instruction on retirement savings. In fact, I think it's fair to say that I would give Speaker's office instruction on retirement savings and have done that consistently over the course of Republican speakers and Democratic speakers. And by and large, they've just about all agreed with me as time has worn on. In addition, I want to point something out. After 15 years, I have worked and sought advice and testimony on annuitization, on IRAs, on defined benefits, defined contributions, Social Security, you name it. I carved out in this Congress, I think over all of those years, a reputation for somebody who paid great attention to the whole idea of retirement savings. And we still have the same problem. It's people at the lower end that can't set aside prescribed dollars because there's not the apparatus to allow them to do it. And the notion that we're placing a burden by using tax credits for people to set up the system that will be farmed out to those I described earlier, I think is the reality of it. Appreciate the course of the conversation, but I'd like now to call the question. Those in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. On that, I ask a recorded vote. Mr. Brady has requested a recorded vote. And the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? Delbene votes no. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer? Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? Mr. Swazi? Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed votes aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Schweikert votes aye. Mr. Schweikert votes aye. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood? Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. 
Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. LaHood? LaHood, yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes no. Would the clerk hold on for one moment? Mr. Boyle is having technical difficulties. Is there some way? We, I don't think oh, we can hold typing. it. He's typing. I just don't think we can hold this up much yeah, longer. Yeah. That's fine. Right. I think that uh, we're going to proceed, and uh, Mr. Boyle could perhaps just send a, no, a note indicating that uh, how he intended to vote or amend the record. So, would the uh, clerk report? Mr. Chairman, I have 24 nays and 18 ayes. There being 24 nays and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Are there any other amendments in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Brady is recognized. Thank you. I uh, have two amendments. Mr. Uh, Chairman, are... Mr. Thompson is right. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman is reserved a point of order. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two amendments. They're both very simple but very direct. This first. Um, simply replaces this section of uh, this subtitle with the Secure 2.0 bipartisan bill that we passed unanimously earlier this year. It simply chooses bipartisan common ground on retirement over partisan ones. I urge uh, its support. Yield back. Mr. Thompson, do you reserve your yes. point of order? Yes. Mr. Chairman, is this the amendment that was previously distributed? Yes, with some small changes. No changes. Mr. Chairman, I understand that amendment is not germane. It's outside our subject matter. So the chair rules that the amendment is not germane. And so, Mr. Chairman, if I may be heard. Mr. Brady. So I'll do this again very briefly. I think the whole point of this subtitle is, as we agree, 
improve the retirement system and expand access. That's exactly what Secure 2.0 does. I yield. So does the gentleman, do you want to? I will. I will yield the, the ruling of the chair. Yes, okay. sir. When you, Let when me it's, just use the moment to, to assure the minority here I intend to get the SECURE Act over the goal line, period. So the question is on the ruling of the chair. Mr. Brady has challenged the ruling of the chair. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I move to table. Mr. Thompson has ruled, is moved to table the motion. And with that, the clerk will call the roll. Oh, the question is on a motion, ta to motion to table the ruling of the chair. Those in favor say aye. Is aye. aye. Table. Those opposed, no. Roll call vote, yes, sir. Yeah, clerk roll will call, call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Aye. Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Larson votes yes. Mr. Blumenauer? <laughs> Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind, aye. Mr. Kind votes aye. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell votes yes. Mr. Pascrell votes yes. Mr. Davis? Davis votes aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, yes. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes yes. Ms. Sewell votes yes. Ms. Delbene? Aye. Ms. Delbene votes aye. Ms. Chu? Chu votes aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee? Aye. Mr. Kildee votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer? Mr. Evans? Evans votes yes. Mr. Evans votes yes. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes yes. Mr. Schneider votes yes. Mr. Swazi? Aye. Mr. Swazi votes aye. Mr. Panetta? Aye. Mr. Panetta votes aye. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes aye. Ms. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Gomez? Gomez aye. Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady? Brady votes no. Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes no. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed? Reed votes no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert votes no. Ms. Walorski? Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood? LaHood is no. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Wenstrup? Dr. Wenstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington? No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes? Estes votes no. Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn? No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller? No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes yes. Mr. Byer votes yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman votes yes. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 24 ayes and 18 noes. There being 24 ayes and 18 noes, the challenge to the chair fails.
Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman Texas, Mr. Thank Brady. you. I have a final amendment. Mr. Brady. Can I have an amendment at the desk? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thompson. I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson reserves a point of order. We'll just pause for a moment while the amendment is passed out. Another amendment. Find it out. The gentleman is recognized to speak on his amendment. For the sake of brevity, Mr. Chairman, I'll go directly to what this amendment does. It replaces the new mandate and tax on Main Street businesses with the bipartisan policy on our enrollment we agreed to and passed unanimously in Secure 2.0. There's two reasons for this, and I think you ought to consider this carefully. First, imposing a new tax and unlimited legal liability on businesses as small as five or six employees, as a subtitle would do, is I think absolutely the wrong approach to expanding retirement savings. It has real serious unintended consequence. There's a second reason as well. I think one of the benefits are of our defined contribution system and the reason it's been so successful is that individuals have a high degree of trust in that private sector providers and the federal laws that safeguard their investments. This subtitle would undermine that trust by endorsing state-run retirement for the first time at the federal level. It would allow state-run schemes that don't provide these strong protections to proliferate. State-run retirement is a major departure from the current model. These plans often lack the same rights, protections for investors enjoyed by workers who contribute to a qualified retirement plan. They are exempt from ERISA. And the major change in the law Deserves, deserves a full debate, has received almost no consideration by the committee, but could have serious implications for savers, particularly younger workers, who are more likely to be forced into an inferior and less protective state-run program by the bill. My view, too, is that this could be a first step uh, toward future nationalization of some significant portion of the ret private retirement system that's worked so well. I caution us against that, believe we need to have a full debate. Uh, I urge this amendment, and Mr. Chairman, uh, yield back. Thanks. Would the gentleman consider yielding to Mr. Swiker, who has been trying energetically to get my attention? I absolutely would. I yield to Mr. Swiker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, previous chairman. Hey, I, I'm, I'm sorry, um, this is slightly off the amendment, but I, it was a germane, I thought the comment was germane to the last amendment, was not germane. Um, is the goal of the majority to make it so if to obtain a saver's credit, I can't be a full-time student? So when I went back to grad school in my late 30s, if I was a full-time student, even though I was still working my job, because if you take a look at your page 40 and go to B, um, I think if you actually read through that, You've drafted a piece of legislation here that will discourage people from working a job and actually going and being a full-time student. And because as soon as they do that full-time student, it looks like the way your draft is, they don't get the savers credit. So uh, um, I don't know if it's addressed a drafting error or there's something intentional there. And with that, I yield back. California insists upon his point of order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. Thompson has withdrawn his point of order. Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans would like to speak on the amendment. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I know that you and your leadership and the ranking member have tried to very effectively work together on this issue. I'm very proud of the great work we have done together in this committee on a bipartisan base in the retirement area. Last Congress, we enacted to setting every community up for retirement enhancing, also known as the SECURE Act. The SECURE Act was one of the most significant retirement bills to become law in over a decade. 
For example, the SECURE Act requires employers to allow long-term and part-time workers to participate in the 401k plan. Thanks to this provision, 4 million Americans will have the opportunity to save at work. The bill also makes it easier for small businesses to offer retirement plans to their employees by eliminating outdated barriers to the use of the multi-employer plans. As a result of this provision, estimate 600 to 700,000 have retirement accounts will be formed. And then building on that success, a few months ago, this committee passed a second comprehensive retirement secure act too. For 2 we include legislation related to student loans and matching contribution and increase the requirement minimum distribution age further to 75. We indexed the catch-up contribution rate for RAs and created a high catch-up contribution. We have made tremendous progress in improving our retirement system with the SECURE Act, and we continue to do so. This amendment will strike the, the auto IRA provision and replace it provision. In 2 we essentially require all 401ks. I oppose this amendment because essentially the, R, the auto IRA provision in this subtitle also require automatic enrollments for new 401k plans. But the provision also takes an additional step by requiring employees that don't currently offer a retirement plan to facilities at a min minimum on auto IRA. We call that the smallest employers and those who have been in business for a couple of years. But also, when this law goes into effect, Millions of Americans' workers will now have a retirement plan to work. The auto IRA proposal is about addressing the retirement base to base Americans. So, Mr. Chairman, let's not let the work that you have led, along with the ranking member assisting you in this effort, let's not lose what we have built upon. Let's continue building upon better. I say to you, Mr. Chairman, I suggest that we oppose this amendment. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas on the amendment, Mr. Arrington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I do also commend you for your leadership and working with Ranking Member Brady and, and really forging the bipartisan outcome of Secure, um, Secure Act and, and Secure 2.0. It was no small feat. I think it was one of your finest hours as our as our leader for this committee. Um, I think that and, and surprise medical billing. I've just never been more proud to be a Ways and Means committee member. But and again, with all due respect, I, I just um, I can't believe that we are to the point in this country in terms of what we see the role of the federal government that we would tell people, force them, penalize them if they don't, mandate that they set up these retirement accounts. And, and, and I don't care whether you're black, Hispanic, or white, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm offended that somehow we, representatives of the people's government, think that, that, that our citizens aren't smart enough, capable enough, res responsible enough to set up these retirement accounts when they can. Um, and, and so it, it just seems, it seems to pierce that sacred veil of freedom and responsibility, both for the small business and for the individual. But then I reflect on, on the cumulative effect, which you've heard repeatedly from my colleagues, the cumulative effect of all the mandates and taxes um, and regulations, and I think about just the recent ones, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, the government shutdowns that our small businesses had to, to live through. We gave them some PPP relief, but for most that wasn't making them whole. They have higher input costs across the board, namely energy costs now with inflation. We sidelined millions of, of their employees. Just recently, 50% of all small businesses could not hire everybody back to serve their customers. And like I said, some have had to uh, shut down completely. You go to the tax side, 
the marginal rates are going to increase according to uh, my colleague's plan. The corporate rates are going to increase, and most people don't appreciate, but 80% of all corporations are small businesses with about 25 employees or less. Senator Wyden, and I don't know because I haven't seen the tax subtitle, but the Senator Wyden wants to repeal the 20% deduction that small businesses get. That's $66 billion in savings that 21 million small businesses get. And then we're going to double the capital gains tax. That's going to smack them around. And then you've got the oil and gas guys, 9,000 small independent oil and gas folks that work so hard to give us energy independence, to give us reliable, uh, uh, cost-effective energy and fuel for this economy and for our consumers. And this is going to hit those guys, not to mention the punitive tax uh, provisions that I hear are coming down the pike. We talked about the death tax and the 2 million family farms. Um, 12 weeks, 12 weeks, these folks are going to get a mandate where people can leave for 60 days with seven days notice. Um, if, the, if the PRO Act is included in this, we're going to unionize. We're going to force unionization uh, and usurp the freedom of their employees and, again, force feed a mandate to these small businesses. I just think about all of that cost and that burden and that government intervention. I can't believe that America has been as powerful and as prosperous over the years and as exceptional without the government there to hold our hand all the way through it. We're over coddled. We are so it, it, we've created an entitlement culture. We're, we're 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 really weakening the fabric of this country. We're gutting the stuff that made America the greatest country on the planet. I keep hearing everybody say that. And then we say, then why shouldn't we be offering the things that every other country does? Well, the first answer is because we can't afford it. And the second answer is we all want these things, but there is a better way to go about it than such heavy handed top down interventionist policy. So I hope you'd reconsider. I don't think you will, Mr. Chairman, but, um, I needed to express that strong view, um, and uh, I, I support my colleague's amendment, obviously, my ranking member, and, um, and I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman. Question comes on the amendment offered by Mr. Brady. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion no. of the chair, the no's have it. Now on that, Mr. Chairman, I would ask Mr. Mr. Brady has requested. A roll call vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Mr. Doggett? Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Blumenauer? No. Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Blumenauer votes n You have to use the mic. You have to use the mic. Right here. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? <coughs> Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? No. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer? Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. 
Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Thank you. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Mr. Buchanan? Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Votes aye. Mr. Smith Buchanan of Nebraska? Buchanan votes aye. Oh, Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed votes aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Hmm. Mr. Schweikert? Ms. Walorski? Aye. Ms. Walorski votes aye. Mr. LaHood? LaHood is aye. Mr. LaHood votes aye. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Doggett? No. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Mr. Chairman, I have 24 no's and 17 ayes. 24 no's and 17 ayes. The amendment fails. If there are no further amendments, the question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute uh, is agreed to. I will now recognize Mr. Thompson for the purpose of offering a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee favorably report subtitle B, Budget Reconciliation Legislative Recommendations Relating to Retirement as amended to the House of Representatives. The question. The question is on transmitting the bill, subtitle B, as amended to the House Committee on the Budget, and members are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and subtitle B as amended, vote. is ordered transmitted to the House Committee on the Budget, and Mr. Brady has requested a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Aye. Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson? Thompson? Aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Larson votes yes. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer, aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Yes. Mr. Pascrell votes yes. Mr. Davis? Davis votes aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, yes. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes yes. Ms. Sewell votes yes. Ms. Delbene? Aye. 
Ms. Delbene votes aye. Ms. Chu? Chu votes aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Ms. Moore? Votes aye. Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes aye. Mr. Kildee votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Evans? Aye. Mr. Evans votes aye. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes aye. Mr. Schneider votes aye. Mr. Swazi? Aye. Mr. Swazi votes aye. Mr. Panetta? Aye. Mr. Panetta votes aye. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, aye. Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady? Brady votes no. Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunes? Nunes votes no. Mr. Nunes votes no. Mr. Buchanan? No. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed? Reed votes no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? No. Could you repeat that? No. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice? No. Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweikert? No. Mr. Schweikert votes no. Ms. Walorski? Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood is no. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Wenstrup? No. Dr. Wenstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington? No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes? Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn? No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller? No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman votes aye. Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 22 ayes and 20 noes. There being 22 ayes and 20 noes, the measure passes. The motion is agreed to. Subtitle B is amended as order transmitted to the House Committee on Budget without objection. Staff are authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the committee print, and members have two additional days to file with the committee clerk supplemental, additional, or dissenting and minority views. Our next order of business is Subtitle C, Budget Reconciliation Legislative Recommendations Relating to Child Care Access and Equity, which will make investments to address an issue that too often causes American parents and guardians stress and anxiety. Well before the COVID-19 pandemic, child care access was an insurmountable, bar insurmountable barrier to work and financial stability for many families across the United States. A 2018 analysis found that approximately half the country has too few licensed child care options to meet demand. This inaccessibility has significant effects on Americans, America's economy and workforce, particularly for women. According to the analysis by the National Women's Law Center, expanding access to affordable, child quality, high quality child care to everyone who needs it would increase the number of women ages 25 to 54 with young children working full-time by a full year, or about 17 percent, and by about 31 percent for women with any, without any college degree. Moreover, child care workers themselves are severely underpaid, causing hardship for them and high turnover in the field. Child care workers earn less than $24,000 a year, about $11.50 an hour. A survey of early childhood staff found that Nearly 75% worry about being able to pay their bills 
and while almost half are concerned with having to, enough food for their families. 92% of the child care workers are women, and 40% are women of color. Both the barriers to accessing child care and the undervaluing of child care workers are deepening inequities in our nation, straining families and undercutting our economy. The COVID crisis merely exacerbated these existing problems and heightened the urgency with which we must act. The recommendations included in Subtitle C propose investments that will directly address the challenges women at all levels of income face, finding child care, raise child care worker wages, and improve physical infrastructure to make child care safer and more affordable for all families. We will provide much needed funds for child care business owners to conduct physical infrastructure projects that update, grow, and improve the supply of child care in the United States while being responsive to new public health guidelines associated with social distancing and sanitation. Catherine Clark championed this investment, which passed the House in the previous Congress and is included in the Biden American Jobs Plan. We also fund the creation of Child Care Information Network that provides parents and guardians with real-time information about child care availability and helps them apply for slots that meet their needs. I want to acknowledge the leadership that the advocates and mothers Moms Rising have shown on this excellent initiative. Nina Perez, Moms Rising National Director of Early Learning, testified before the committee during a hearing on these issues in May of this year. She spoke of the sacrifices her own family had to make due to the failings of the child care system and emphasized the importance of proposals like the Child Care Information Network for Families. To help raise the floor for child care provider pay, we invest in child care wage grants for small businesses. This would offer crucial support to child care workers who are disproportionately women of color earning poverty level wages for important work. And finally, we also propose providing funds to upgrade infrastructure and parent information in American Indian and Alaska Native communities and properly consult them in keeping with tribal, with tribal sovereignty. Quality, accessible child care is essential for America's working parents, and child care workers add tremendous value for families and for our economy. Their compensation should reflect the significance of those contributions. Investments in child care are investments in our workforce and our sustained economic might. As I've said before, while roads, bridges, and public transit may get workers to their jobs, it's child care that helps to keep them there. I look forward to seeing our members' robust support for these measures. Now let me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Walarski, for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We can all agree that working parents do need to be able to rely on child care to keep their children safe and healthy throughout the day. Even before COVID, we knew that many Americans lacked access to affordable, high-quality child care. The pandemic has only exacerbated these concerns with the child care industry hit hard by this crisis and the slow reopening of schools. Until now, Republicans and Democrats have consistently worked together to provide additional support for child care. Prior to the pandemic, Congress had already doubled funding for the child care block grant and increased funding for Head Start and preschool development programs. In the CARES Act, Congress came together to provide much needed support for child care providers and essential workers in response to COVID, providing an additional $3.5 billion in funding. And again, last December, the bipartisan appropriations bill provided an additional $10 billion in funding for child care. In March, instead of pausing at the behest of Republicans, Democrats included an additional $40 billion, including child care stabilization grants and a permanent increase in child care entitlement funding. Let me do the math. In less than 14 months, Congress has provided more than $53 billion in new funding for child care. That is more than the entire annual revenue of the child care industry in 2019. Now, Democrats are de de demanding that we spend even more money on child care for new facilities and, quote, child care access and equity. This bill contains five new child care programs that CBO estimates would cost $27 billion. Even worse, Education and Labor Committee Democrats are marking up their own reconciliation bill that provides an additional $225 billion for child care and $225 billion for universal pre-K. Just like with paid leave, Democrats are clearly not on the same page. 
It's time to put the brakes on. It's been exactly five months since we pumped an additional $40 billion into child care. States are floating in child care money, and many are concerned about the state's ability to spend it. We know that in multiple states, this funding has not made it down to the child care providers or families. According to HHS, less than 2% of the child care stabilization funds provided by the American Rescue Plan Act have been outlaid by states. A child care provider in my district raised concerns with me about the rate at which money is being dumped into the system. He said, quote, when I hear that Biden wants to include child care in his next spending proposal, I expect money to be thrown around by the boatload and a lot more requirements on providers, all in the name of, quote, helping children. All of this, he says, will drive me right out of business. Republicans want to make sure that states spend the money they already have responsibly and that it actually reaches those who need it. Committee Republicans released an alternative with flexible solutions that working families can count on. Our discussion draft, the Protecting Worker Paychecks and, Pay Choi and Family Choice Act, would ensure more Americans have access to child care that meets their needs, not Washington mandates. Our plan empowers parents to choose a child care that fits their family needs and targets existing funding to states with higher concentrations of children in poverty. It also includes options for states to better leverage these new child care investments to increase the supply of child care in rural and underserved areas. Republicans on this committee have introduced 10 child care bills in the last three months, many of them jointly with members of the Education and Labor Committee. But Ways and Means Democrats have again chosen to go it alone. As a result, not one of these proposals received consideration despite Democrats' lip service about bipartisanship. As we continue to combat this public health and economic emergency, we should be working together to ensure the availability of safe, affordable child care for hardworking Americans. This bill is a reckless use of American taxpayer dollars. It layers additional mandates on states and providers at exactly the wrong time. I oppose this amendment in the nature of a substitute and encourage my colleagues to reject this partisan plan. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Wolarski. And without objection, the measure will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. At this time, I offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute, which was distributed in advance, along with the green sheet explaining it. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read, open for amendment at any point, and considered base tax for the purpose of the amendment. Before we get to questions, I will now turn to Morna Miller, the Staff Director for the Subcommittee on Worker and Family Support, to provide the technical description of the amendment in the nature of a substitute with an emphasis on changes that have been made since introduction. I ask members to hold their questions until after her presentation. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The committee print of Subtitle C, Child Care Access and Equity, would amend Section 418 of the Social Security Act in order to invest in physical infrastructure improvements to child care facilities, provide a 75% federal match for states and U.S. territories to operate parent information systems called the Child Care Information Network, and invest in tribal child care, and provide grants to small business child care providers to increase wages for workers. The amendment of the nature of a substitute corrects one typographical error in the committee print, correcting child care provider to child care providers, plural. It also provides the Department of Health and Human Services with additional flexibility by changing a requirement to issue guidance for the new wage grant program to encompass both guidance and technical assistance. That concludes my walkthrough. I'd be happy to answer any technical questions the members of the committee have about the committee print. Are we ready for questions? Are there any questions about the amendment in the nature of a substitute? No. Is there anyone who wishes to strike the last word? The gentleman from Illinois is recognized to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As chairman of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over child care, I've heard the stories from witnesses from across the country about struggling to find and afford child care. 
Black women work and use paid child care at higher rates than other groups, but they earn less, so they struggle to pay the bill. Furthermore, poor communities like mine are disproportionately likely to be child care deserts, where there are more than three young children for every available child care slot. I've heard from child care workers about how they can't afford their own child care given their low wages. Given that about 94% of child care workers are women and about 40% are people of color, child care wages affect the quality and stability of child care as well as the ratio and gender equity of our workforce. I'm proud to support this committee print that investments in a comprehensive information system to make it easier for hard-working parents to find child care that fit their needs, that invests in physical infrastructure to improve the supply and safety of child care and reduces child care deserts, and that invest in child care wage grants for small businesses to decrease turnover, improve market stability, and increase equity. Ways and Means has stepped up to address key child care challenges of workers and families from all income levels to help rebuild our economy and care for our children. I urge my colleagues to support this committee print, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, it is my anticipation and hope that we're going to be able to finish this tonight, I hope in the next hour and a half or so. So with that in mind, uh, we have a busy day tomorrow, and I know that members are anxious to return to their districts for the uh, acknowledgement of uh, the tragic events of 9-1-1, but we intend to get through this legislation. So. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Mm. Chairman, every parent dreams of a better future for their children. A high quality education from an early age is a critical first step in their child's growth and development. Sadly, our system needs improvement to help parents reach these goals for their children, but this proposal is not the answer. This legislation shamefully discriminates against churches and religious institutions that provide child care services or rewarding the Democrats' union supporters with sweetheart deals on renovating child care facilities. And it would create a massive government-run system for child care providers with no regard to whether there's existing a similar federal agency with the same function. Throwing more taxpayer dollars at a problem without addressing the need is not the solution. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Congress has already spent a significant amount of money on child care, totaling $53 billion. This is equivalent to the entire annual revenue of the child care industry in 2019. Much of this needed federal funding has yet to reach the local communities and families for which it was intended. Adding another $27 billion in federal funding that this bill proposes is irresponsible and would only financially burden our children and grandchildren, the, vac the exact lives that we are trying to improve. While keeping in mind that we should be fiscally responsible for future generations, the best approach to expand access to affordable child care is to improve the current system and better leverage the existing $53 billion of funding. Under current law, financing for child care and early education involves multiple funding and, and programs with different eligibility requirements, governance structures, and quality standards. This creates challenges to families and communities in navigating services and can lead to overlap gaps in services, and wasteful spending. That's why I introduced the modernization, the modernization financing of Early Care and Education in America Act with my education and, and labor colleague, Mr. Burgess Owens. That bill will take a serious look at how we modernize and bring all these different funding streams together to find a way to update and modernize the financing. A maze of duplicate systems do not improve outcomes for our children. With the identification of duplicate programs and streamlining of federal funds, we can better use the existing $53 billion of taxpayer funding for our children through new investments, targeted funding, and preserving parent choice. In the end, 
Child care reform is about increasing options for parents, for families, and providing better resources for our children. By reducing duplicate funding, streamlining the system, and leveraging available funds, we can achieve these goals for our children without compromising their future. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yeah. Let me recognize the gentleman from uh, Wisconsin, Mr. Kine, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief and to the point, but Mr. Chairman, I wanted to speak in favor of this subsection. Uh, two of the three subsections that we took up today address one of the chief challenges that we're facing as a nation, and that's labor force participation. And unfortunately, demographics in our nation are working against us on that front. We have 70 million baby boomers beginning their massive retirement, about 10,000 a day leaving the workforce. We have a declining birth rate, so we don't have the replacement workers coming up behind them. And we have a messed up immigration policy. So unless someone here on committee has a magic answer to address uh, one or all three of those challenges that we face, we're not gonna hit our GDP growth targets, which are based on two determinants, work workforce participation and worker productivity, because we just don't have the number of workers that are needed given the demand for them right now. We see this coming out of the COVID virus. Uh, I'm sure all my colleagues are hearing the same thing I am as we travel around our respective districts, businesses large and small, all crying for more workers. Um, but right now, um, we have to be focused on making work participation easier for people. And therefore, family medical leave is gonna be essential. So if you have a sick child or a sick relative or family member, and you need to temporarily step out of the workforce to address that, you don't fear uh, the risk of losing your job or, or perhaps being terminated. But we also need to ensure that there's quality, affordable uh, child care for families so that they know when they do go into the workforce that their children are going to be safe and going to be taken care of. This subsection is relatively benign in what is being, uh, what is being offered here. It establishes a comprehensive information system for parents called the Child Care Information Network so they can make better decisions in their local communities or where the child care providers are, provides a federal grant program for physical infrastructure needs. It has child care wage grants to address uh, inequity issues, raise wages, reduce child care worker turnover, which is a huge problem uh, right now, it provides additional support to tribal communities. And it also establishes a child care provider cert certification process that would make them eligible for other programs and grants uh, in order to maintain that business and offer quality services. So unless someone has an answer to slow down 70 million baby boomers from leaving the workforce here in the next 10, 15 years, or uh, addressing a declining birth rate so that families are having more children rather than fewer, or fixing the broken immigration system, which is a, has been another source of both skilled and unskilled labor needs in our country, we're gonna need as a committee and as a Congress to be focused on making it easier for people to participate uh, in the workforce so we can meet our growth targets. That's family medical leave, that's quality affordable childcare. It's exactly the subsections that we're trying to address today in today's markup. So I encourage my colleagues to uh, adopt this subsection and continue the conversation of where we need to do to bolster uh, workforce participation in our country. I yield back. Thank Mr. the gentleman. The, the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, is recognized to strike the last word. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, Ms. Walorski, for her leadership on the Worker and Family Support Subcommittee and for offering this amendment. It seems once again our Democrat colleagues choose not to work with, on, work with us on efforts that could have been bipartisan, such as child care. Child care legislation can and should be bipartisan. We know that when we meet it together as a subcommittee. One size fits all Washington mandated child care is not the right answer. Not everyone's the same. We don't need to create new entitlement programs, but we do need to set families up for success. I introduced a bill that's included in Representative Walorski's amendment that would give employers more flexibility to tailor child care benefits to meet their employees' unique needs. Everyone is different. 
The employer provided child care tax credit is an existing permanent tax credit aimed at helping employers provide child care for their employees. The problem is that currently this can only be used by employers who offer on-site child, child care services. This is often, very often, not possible or feasible. My bill would allow employees to use this credit if they contract an outside child care provider to offer these services. I urge the adoption of my colleague's amendment that would offer families the flexibility needed to address their own unique child care needs, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to strike the last word. I could come back to the gentleman if he has to get his notes there. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, we need to make long-term investment in our nation's child care physical infrastructure, increase parental access to real-time information about available child care, and raise the wages of the underpaid child care workforce. Inadequate child care options are a major factor holding back our economic recovery because parents simply cannot go to work if they don't have reliable child care. These long-term investments must be made separate from the short-term emergency relief we provided to address urgent child care shortages caused by the pandemic and also in addition to current levels of guaranteed funding for child care, which are woefully inadequate. Inadequate child care is a major equity issue, not only because Lack of decent child care options disproportionately harm labor force participation, income, and career progression for women, but also because our overworked, underpaid child care workforce is disproportionately made up of women of color. This amendment would prevent us from addressing this issue. We know that access to child's safe child care facilities is the top priority for parents when looking for child care. But we also know that the majority of our child care facilities are so in need of repair that children in danger, which puts parents in an impossible situation. This amendment would prevent us from addressing that. Finding decent child care is pretty much a second full-time job for parents, and this would prevent them from getting the information to make it easier. I oppose the amendment and yield back. Let me uh, recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to strike the last word. Thank you, Chairman Neal. Many of my colleagues have already stated that we have plenty of money for funding for child care. Congress allocated over $50 billion in child care in just the 14 past months due to the pandemic. Unfortunately, none of these funding increases have really addressed the underlying causes of expensive child care, which are the overburdensome regulations that hurt small businesses and ultimately drive up the cost of care. Regulations for child care from federal, state, and local governments build upon each other, creating contradictory policies and procedures and imposing unnecessary and burdensome requirements on child care providers. It's another case of government begetting more government and begetting more government. Maximum child staff ratios, group size limits, and onerous training requirements can have many unintended consequences of significantly increasing the cost of child care. Some states even require daycare providers to have a bachelor's degree to work at a daycare. In rural communities in particular, this is just overkill when so many of the skills of working in childcare are learned on the job, not in the classroom. Requiring all workers in childcare setting to have a college degree is ridiculous. It increases costs, it burdens already low paid providers with unnecessary student loan debt, and it derives others out of the profession who may really be interested in a career in childcare 
but they can't afford to go to college at the time, particularly in rural areas when the need of whatever the child's age is is directly dependent upon who is working with them. The needs of a baby, a one-year-old, and a two-year-old are entirely different in, than a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a child with special needs. And so there is no one-size-fits-all in early childhood education. We need to better understand the costs and the benefits of additional requirements in order to ensure that we can provide high quality early learning environments for children, but also not create the unnecessary regulatory burden, particularly by identifying requirements that are high cost, but have little to no effect on the quality of the education. You know, we, we talk about the number of words that children need to learn at a particular age. If they need to learn 300 words by the age of three, they need people who can read to them, who can nurture them. They don't necessarily need a college degree to do that. I urge this committee to undergo the work of ensuring taxpayer dollars are spent effectively and that overburdensome regulations no longer restrict access to childcare. We want to help people who are working. And this is one way we can do it. So let's work together to foster a regulatory environment for child care centers to thrive. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, to strike the last word. As the chairman, I move to strike the last Gentleman's word. recognized. During uh, this pandemic, we all became painfully aware of how essential child care is to our neighbors. The pandemic chain shined a bright, painful light on barriers to assessing child care. Quality child care that matches work schedules and the needs of families is a way too difficult to find. One study found about 22% of all American parents were either not working or were working less because of child care challenges during 2020. These figures are a staggering indictment of the status quo. This must be a priority for us. Today, we invest in key areas that will offer historic help to families and child care workers alike. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Lady, gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as we as a nation look, oh, we as a nation are long overdue in addressing quality, affordable child care access for all workers. This is especially true in the case for a workforce in my district, which is predominantly comprised of women of color. The work previously done by this committee regarding the expansion of the child tax credit has been a lifeline to so many of my constituents, especially during this pandemic. There is still more work to be done, and so I'm proud that this committee has a distinct history of crafting some of the nation's largest anti-poverty programs. We must rise to the occasion once again and do, and do, and, and do not only what is best, but, know it, but do what we believe is right at this important time in our nation's history. When I think about the fact that my district is predominantly African American and that so many of the black women are sole providers of care, child care in their families, this has been exacerbated by the coronavirus. Many have seen that their responsibilities have increased and that their earnings have declined. They are among the hardest hit by its economic fallout. Single mothers are grappling with poverty, job loss, hunger, illness, underemployment, and unstable housing. Single mothers of color face the most desperate situations. Nearly two in five families headed by black and Hispanic women live in poverty compared to 28% of white women. Native American women face the highest rates of 43%. Alabama is not immune from this issue. According to the census data, more than a quarter of Alabama households are headed by single, single mothers. The gap in childcare 
is exacerbated not only by the pandemic, but by low participation rates in the workforce for women of color. The gap is also exacerbated by those in rural communities because 75% of Alabama is considered rural, an estimated 60% of children under the age of five live in childcare deserts. Census tracts where there is no childcare or only very limited childcare. Yet for low and middle income families, the cost of childcare is often up to 30% of the household's income. In some areas, even more than college tuition. I am proud to support the subtitle C because I believe it is making a significant down payment on child care access and equity. This legislation invests in much needed digital infrastructure to ensure that parents can get up to date information about available child care and easily be able to apply for open slots. It also builds upon child care facilities and remodeling existing facilities to make sure that they are safer and more responsive to new public health guidelines. Lastly, Subtitle C will also raise the wages of essential child care workforce who are currently earn a, a minimum, a, a median wage of only $12 per hour. And this is much lower in states like Alabama where the minimum, child, well, where the minimum wage is $7.25. Subtitle C is inclusive of Indian tribes and all five U.S. territories to address child care needs for all Americans. Now is the time for us to once again put a down payment on our most important asset, our children. Let's do so. Let's vote for, for the subsec for subtitle C. And I yield back. The Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to strike the last word. Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. I'm proud to speak in support of investments put forward by this committee for the care economy of our country. Finding and affording quality child care is a source of financial and emotional stress for working parents, especially for women, low-wage workers, and people of color. For low-wage workers, work is impossible without child care subsidies and difficult even with assistance. In addition, many low-income parents are likely to have jobs with unpredictable, variable, or inflexible schedules that require them to work outside of typical business hours, making childcare even more expensive and harder to obtain. While affordable and quality childcare access was a problem before 2020, COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation with many providers forced to close their doors. And we in this committee heard directly from the women impacted by these kind of childcare barriers during our full committee hearing in April. Like Agnes Braga, a single mother and a speech language pathologist in the LA Unified School District who struggled to find appropriate and affordable childcare for her 16 year old son and 12 year old daughter. Agnes is one of millions of hardworking mothers mothers who make a good living and who are up against dual pressures of the pandemic and childcare access. That is why I am so glad that today we're taking action on investments that will provide parents and caregivers with data on available childcare slots in their communities, helping ease the burden faced by many families in areas where the childcare supply is especially low. Additionally, investments in the physical infrastructure of childcare facilities will go a long way in increasing access to high quality childcare for low income families. COVID-19 exposed the reality that many facilities are not prepared to deal with needed improvements in physical infrastructure, including installing child size sinks for healthy hand washing practices, quality air filtration equipment to improve air circulation and dedicated spaces for play and engagement in a safe distance. Our bill today would help these facilities make necessary upgrades to their infrastructure and is an important complement to the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed by the Senate. Finally, I strongly support the provision of this bill that provides wage subsidy grants to small and home-based child providers. Teaching infants, toddlers, and preschool age children requires the equivalent level of skills and knowledge as teaching older children, yet the pay 
for the early care and education workforce is less than half of what kindergarten teachers make. In 2018, one of 10 child care workers had incomes below the federal poverty line. In LA County, where my district is, early care and education staff make an average of between $11.73 and $14.75 per hour, which is extremely low for such a high cost area. Due to a lack of public investments, the child care workforce is supplementing the high price of care through their low wages. Higher pay will improve job quality and stability for child care workers, helping them to support themselves and their families in turn, and can improve con continuity and quality of care for children. Thank you again to Chairman Neal for bringing this bill before us today, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you so very, very much, Mr. Chairman. And I do agree with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that this really ought to be a bipartisan bill. Because women, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, are, their workforce participation is deeply impacted by their ability to get child care, and not just any old child care, but quality child care. I think we would all really recognize and agree that times have changed. You know, we don't have stay-home moms anymore uh, that stay home and raise the kids while pop dad goes off and earns enough money to take, take care of the entire family. He has a, a health care uh, insurance plan that insures himself, his wife, and their 12 kids. Those days are long gone by. And women are over 50% of the workforce these days. And we have seen just from this pandemic that their workforce participation has dipped considerably because they were forced to stay at home because of the pandemic. For all of those of you who have waxed on today demanding that the workers get back to work, blaming extended unemployment benefits for reasons that people have not gone back to work. I invite you to look at this huge market failure in our economy to provide childcare at an affordable rate. Uh, as people have pointed out, this bill will help the workforce, which is primarily women of color, uh, to have adequate wages, but it also helps any woman. Just think if you're, the, if you're that nice white woman who's gotten yourself a good job being someone's executive assistant and you're making $70,000 a year, how in the world do you pay for your one child at the going rate of $12.24 an hour? How do you, how do you come up with $25,460 a year out of your $70,000 salary to pay for that child care? Even if you uh, get the family rate, you get some woman to babysit for you at a slave wage of $7.25 an hour, that's still, uh, uh, $15,000 um, uh, uh, $15, a year. How do you afford that? You don't. And if you're some welfare recipient being taunted about how lazy you are and you won't go back to work, how do you do it when you're going to some welfare, workfare job that pays you less than the cost of daycare? I've had the misfortune in my time to know, to know women who have faced this struggle at various levels. I'll just name a couple of them because my time is so limited. I remember the woman who was threatened by her employer. She had better not miss any more work else she'd be fired. So she put her baby in the car and checked on him every once in a while and the baby died in the heat and she went to prison for that. I'm thinking of the woman who made $13 an hour and left her five-year-old at home. Instructions, don't answer the door, make yourself a sandwich. And that child ended up in foster care because she quote unquote neglected him. And I can think of the numerous little girls that I've known who've been left in the care of Chester the molester because they have not had adequate daycare, left in the care of people who had roaches in their house and lead paint 
Um, and I say that the time has come for this, and this ought to be bipartisan. I see that my time um, is uh, up. I would beg um, that all of my uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle think of this as a workforce participation bill helping to get women back to work. And I thank you, and I would yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized twice. <laughs> <laughs> I offer my strong support for the committee's proposal that would make a big and bold investment in child care. Child care providers have managed to continue operating fairly under very difficult circumstances. I want to thank and recognize child care workers who have provided such a critical service to American children. Even before the pandemic, long underfunded child care industry faced its serious challenges, and man, many families have had challenges. This bill will help grow and improve the supply of child care in America by helping provide many public health guidelines, improving child care accessibility and importance for our low-income workers, from grocery store employees to health care providers to restaurant staffs, who are much likely to have unpredictable, various inflexible schedules that require them to work outside of typical business hours. This bill will help those workers and countless other parents find affordable child care. So, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for providing the leadership that you have on this critical subject, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last gentleman word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. To my colleagues, we may represent different congressional districts, but we don't represent different realities. This bill benefits all of our constituents, and it does have bipartisan support. Republicans support it, nonpartisans support it, Democrats support it. You may not support it, and you may vote no, but I'll vote yes for my constituents and yours because they desperately need us to provide relief. And I take objection to those of you who talked about the $53 billion of funding that some of you voted for in the CARES 1 and 2 package that was signed by then President Trump, that money actually went directly to providers to help them keep their doors open and to keep workers on the job just like it did for PPP. And I helped many of my small businesses get access to that money. It also went to help our first responders and our health care workers with children have access to child care while they were on the front lines of this pandemic. Was that not the right use of money? And now you're in here saying that we have spent too much money on child care? What reality are you talking about? The reality I'm speaking of is the one that my constituents live with. One parent in my district told me she saw a sign in front of a daycare center near her home saying child care, $170 per week per child. That's almost $700 per month for one child and $2,400 for families with three children. Child care in America is simply unaffordable. Half of parents say that the maximum amount they can afford to pay is $200 a week, and yet the average cost of high-quality, center-based infant care in the United States is $2,400 per month. And yes, people should be properly trained to work with our children. This is not something that you should do unskilled and with low wages. But in Nevada, the issue of child, go, child care goes even further. It's not only expensive, but it's also impossible to find. In addition to literally being in the desert, much of our state is considered a child care desert. According to data from the Center for American Progress, 72% of Nevadans live in areas that are considered a child care desert which means there simply aren't enough childcare 
facilities for the families that need them, including in rural parts of my district. And for the families who do find childcare, they're paying out what averages to be nearly $20,000 a year, or 32% of their median income for two children. That's reality. Nevada's shortage is only surpassed by Utah, where 77% of the state's residents live in a child care desert. And across the country, it's 51%. So this is what we need right now to pass this bill, worth $27 billion over 10 years for child care access and affordability. And as the executive director of the Children's Advocacy Alliance in Nevada told me numerous times, that high quality child care was expensive and difficult to secure before COVID-19, and the pandemic has only exacerbated these conditions. But we also know that this is a gender and racial equity issue. As my colleagues have stated, women of color are disproportionately represented in the child care workforce. About 94% of child care workers are women, and about 40% of workers are people of color who tend to be concentrated in low-wage positions which decrease their ability to afford childcare for their own children. For their own children. And now you want to come in here and say, we're spending too much. And some of you are the same people who talk about issues like a woman's right to choose and tout the preservation of family while not wanting to address the real life struggles that parents face and childcare is one of those struggles. So providing more childcare options while making those options affordable and accessible to families is the best way to preserve families of all kind. And parents need to be able to know that their children are well cared for while they are working. So this is bipartisan. For Democrats, for Republicans, and nonpartisans, you may vote no, but I'll vote yes for my constituents and sadly for yours too. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, who strikes the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. First, I just have to say, Amen, Brother Horsford. I appreciate your words, and I appreciate them not because of how much I know they touch individuals like my own life, but I appreciate them for the veracity of the truth and the reality of what everyday Americans are living through in this country. And this bill, this work, is really to address so much of that that has been exposed over the last year. Some of the things that are in here, we haven't even really addressed. Let's start with the 15 billion investment in childcare infrastructure, the actual facilities that our children are going to be in. Construction, remodeling, making childcare facilities safe and having more of them in the right places so that we can improve childcare access for parents across the country uncapping funding streams to create childcare information networks for parents that would provide frequently updated data on childcare slots that are available in their communities. The waiting list for these slots are unreal. I know in the Virgin Islands, early childcare, we only have two, and then only on one island, not on the other two, three islands in the Virgin Islands. Helping families find out where childcare is available to sign up for. We've heard so much from parents about the mental labor that goes into finding childcare, keeping childcare, and how difficult it is to find childcare that meets their needs. Additionally, my colleagues have talked about the difficulty of small providers. This section, Title C, makes wage subsidy grants to small home based childcare providers. These are childcare providers where it is mainly one person caring for sometimes like six children, or one person and one employee caring for half a dozen children or more. This committee is now putting in a structure to make sure that we are raising the wages 
on all of these small business childcare providers alongside larger childcare center workers. This will be a match at 100% of the cost of providing wage subsidy grants to all eligible small business childcare providers. There's no required match. In the Virgin Islands where I live, where the median income for a family is $43,000 with some of the highest cost of living, families paying between $400 and $700 a month for electricity in the Virgin Islands. Food costs, outrageous food costs because we have to ship in so much of our food. And then that food also has to be in a grocery store where the utility costs are high, and so they pass those on to the consumers as well. This is a much needed investment, and I'm very happy that the unfair territory spending cap under Section 1108 of the Social Security Act has again been held inapplicable to any of the funding for the territories. I want to say personally, Congresswoman Moore talked about those families and those individual women and their need. I can remember in law school, my second year, my children's father at the time, my husband, had been sent on active duty, deployed. I'm in law school, going to school at night, working during the day. Thankfully, I had parents who had recently retired, and they took my children for several months so that I could study for my exams that one year. Many families don't have that opportunity. And I can recall making decisions about whether or not I would make the, even in the investment in going to law school based upon childcare. We are not allowing American families to grow, to invest in themselves. And if we care about the life of a child, care about it outside of the womb as well, please, for God's sake. And so I'm pleased to see that this committee is stepping forward and talking about how much families are struggling in the need for childcare right now and the investment we're making right now and the importance of having childcare available, accessible, and affordable. This is an unprecedented investment in our future in the United States of America. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. We will now proceed to amendments. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? The gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Walarski, is recognized. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California. I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order, and the gentlelady is recognized to speak on her amendment as we pass it out. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would strike and replace subtitle C with proposals to expand. Would the lady sus gentlelady suspend for a couple of seconds just while we can make sure everybody has the amendment? Sure. Yeah. Let's just go ahead. Okay. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would strike and replace Subtitle C with proposals to expand access to affordable child care included in the GOP discussion draft Protecting Worker Paychecks and Family Choice Act. Unlike the majority on this committee who can't seem to get on the same page and work with our colleagues at Education, Labor, Ways and Means, Republicans worked with our Republican colleagues on the Ed and Labor Committee to develop these proposals. When it comes to early care and education programs, collaboration is key. Both of our respective committees have jurisdiction over important components of child care funding, including Head Start and preschool. What happens when we don't work together is we get du duplicative funding streams fragmented across multiple delivery systems that create barriers to access for families and gaps in coverage across early childhood and education programs. That's exactly what's happening here in this subtitle today. These huge new programs don't talk to each other, and there's no complementary policy making going on. If we do not correct the course, taxpayers will bear the cost of this outright power struggle between Democratic leadership. Okay. Hardworking Americans shouldn't be forced to bankroll unnecessary programs to satisfy a power struggle between these two committees. Under the current majority, no one has considered how all these new child care programs are going to work with the current network of government programs already in place 
and there certainly has not been any consideration about how this is a ridiculous proposal and how it will impact families and child care providers on the ground. It appears the thought process is to throw more money at them and hope they won't complain. This child care subtitle as a piece of this whole package is exactly the type of short-sighted partisan policy making that causes more problems and headache than it solves. Republicans on this committee released a proposal to expand access to affordable child care by leveraging the existing investments and giving parents more choices, not Washington control and government mandates to drive up the cost of child care. Our proposal coordinates and streamlines services for families. As any mom, dad, or caregiver across the country will tell you, parents care about having access to safe and affordable care for their kids. They don't care about the inside the beltway squabbling over congressional committee jurisdiction, but they certainly will take notice if these consequences of this inter-party conflict make their lives more difficult. As a solution for American families, our bill includes a range of ways to improve access to child care by improving the employer-provided child care tax credit to provide more flexibility for workers and more generous credits for small employers, helping parents choose child care that best fits their child's needs, prevents the child care cliff for low-income parents, and better targets existing funds to state with higher concentrations of children in poverty, improving flexibility for families using dependent care flexible spending accounts, creating a bipartisan commission to make recommendations on streamlining and reducing duplication and financing of federal early care and education programs. In addition, the bill would allow states to redirect unobligated COVID relief child care funds to prioritize increasing supply and parent choice, extend the period of availability, and allow funding to be used for expansion or construction of new child care options in rural, in rural and shortage areas. This amendment recognizes the investments we've already made in child care and respects the importance of collaboration across committees to achieve the best possible outcomes for the American people. This isn't about Congress. It's about the children and families we all are here to serve. I urge my colleagues to vote for this amendment, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from California. Does he insist upon his point of order? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this amendment deals with subject matter outside that of the matter under consideration. This particular amendment deals with provisions in the tax code. This bill is within the Social Security Act. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman has made a point of order that the proposed amendment is not germane. Does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? If not, the chair is prepared to rule on the point of order. The gentleman from California makes a point of order that the amendment proposed to this section is not germane. Under Clause 7 of House Rule 16, no proposition on a subject different from that under consideration of the underlying bill should be admitted under the color of this amendment. Here the amendment is per in pertinent part seeks to, among other things, amend tax laws. However, the bill here addresses child care social security. As such, the amendment is outside the scope of the bill, fails the basic test of germaneness. The chair rules that the amendment is not in order and that the point of order is sustained. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to appeal the ruling of the chair. The gentlelady would like to appeal the ruling of the chair. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thompson. I move to table. Mr. Thompson moves to table the amendment. All those in favor of tabling the late gentlelady's request signify by saying aye. 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 Are those opposed, no. Aye. Mr. Chairman, I request the, a recorded The gentlelady vote. requested a recorded vote, and the clerk will tally the roll. Mr. Doggett. Aye. Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Larson votes yes. Mr. Blumenauer? Aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind, aye. Mr. Kind votes aye. Mr. Pascrell? Uh, Pascrell votes aye. Mr. Pascrell votes aye. Mr. Davis? Davis votes aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Sanchez? Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins? Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes aye. Ms. Sewell votes aye. Ms. Dalbene? Aye. Ms. Dalbene votes aye. Ms. Chu? Chu votes aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Ms. Moore? 
Moore votes aye. Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes aye. Mr. Kildee votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Byer votes aye. Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes aye. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes aye. Mr. Schneider votes aye. Mr. Swazi? Mr. Swazi? Aye. Mr. Swazi votes aye. Mr. Panetta? Aye. Mr. Panetta votes aye. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes aye. Ms. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez? Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady? Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan? No. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith? Smith votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed? Reed votes no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweikert? No. Mr. Schweikert votes no. Ms. Walorski? No. Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood? No. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Wenstrup? No. Dr. Wenstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington? No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson? Mr. Estes? Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker? Mr. Hearn? Mr. Hearn? Mrs. Miller? No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, yes. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Arrington? Dr. Ferguson? No. Uh, I'm a no. Sorry, it's... I said no, but it was still uh, dialing oh, me in. I, so no. I, that was my error, Mr. Arrington. I have your vote. No worries. Um, Mr. Arrington, no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson? Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes aye. Would the clerk call the roll? Mr. Chairman, I have 24 ayes and 16 noes. There being 24 ayes and 16 noes to sustain the ruling of the chair. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Chairman? Uh, Mr. Reed? Mr. Reed, recognize the gentleman. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Okay, Chairman. do that, Mr. I, Thompson. I, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order. We are passing out Mr. Reed's amendment, and the gentleman will be recognized quickly to speak on his amendment. The gentleman is recognized to speak on his amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, my, my amendment is, is very quite uh, simply uh, drafted to uh, be consistent with what, what many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have indicated, that we need a strategic pause uh, when it comes to, uh, to the passage and consideration uh, of not only this existing uh, legislation, but the entire package making its way through the House committee process. Uh, we have already spent uh, approximately four months or five months ago, $40 billion has been authorized and appropriated to be put into America's child care system. Um, that amendment uh, is and having a difficult time of finding its way uh, out into the front lines of the child care system uh, in America. Now, we agree uh, that child care needs to be supported in America, and we think there are bipartisan agreements that can be reached in order to support child care uh, reforms or additional support uh, with policy enacted here in Washington. But I will tell you, ha having had 53 billion total new funding for child care since the start of the pandemic, that's more than the entire child care revenue uh, estimate spent in America uh, uh, as, as a total industry. Uh, I will tell you, this amendment uh, is consistent uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services indicating to us that only 2% of the most recent money passed as part of the American Rescue Plan has been obligated by states to child care providers or families. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a communication from the Department of Health and Human Services confirming this 2% figure. So ordered. So simply what my amendment would do is essentially delay uh, the uh, spending of additional money uh, from the proposal before this committee today uh, until at least half of that money that's already been previously authorized and appropriated uh, has been documented and certified uh, to have been delivered through the states to the child care industry and child care providers. Uh, this is a simple, reasonable request that says with only 2% of the existing $53 billion plus dollars uh, out there for child care, having been delivered and 48% of that money still out there to be spent, we should take that strategic pause. We should not go forward with this legislation until it's certified that the existing taxpayer dollars are doing their job before we allocate an additional uh, billions of dollars that we see in the proposal before uh, us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I just ask my colleagues to support this simple amendment and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, does the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, continue to insist upon his point of order? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this uh, amendment, it would condition the bill's effect on an unrelated contingency. The amendment makes the bill contingent on funds in another unrelated law. So the gentleman has made a point of order that the proposed amendment is not germane. Does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? If there's no other discussion, the chair is prepared to rule on the point of order. The gentleman from New York makes a point of order. The amendment proposed to this section is not germane. Under Clause 7 of House Rule 16, no proposition shall be admitted under the color of this amendment if it would condition the bill's effect on an unrelated contingency. As such, the amendment is outside the scope of the bill and fails the basic test of germaneness. The chair rules the amendment is not in order and that the point of order is sustained. Mr. Chairman, can I appeal the uh, ruling of the chair? You certainly can. The gentleman has appealed the ruling of the chair. All those in favor Mr. of Mr. Chairman? What? Mr. Thompson? Move to table. Mr. Thompson has moved to table. The, the gentleman's request all those in favor of Mr. Thompson's amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, no. In the no. opinion of the chair, Mr. Thompson's position has prevailed. That's a recorded vote, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Reed has requested a recorded vote on the motion to table. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Aye. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Larson votes yes. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer, aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind, aye. Mr. Kind votes aye. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, yes. Mr. Pascrell votes yes. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, yes. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Ms. Sewell? Ms. Sewell 
votes aye. Ms. Sewell votes aye. Ms. Del Bene? Ms. Del Bene? Del Bene votes aye. Ms. Del Bene votes aye. Ms. Chu? Chu votes aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Ms. Moore? Uh, Moore votes aye. Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes aye. Mr. Kildee votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Byer votes aye. Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes yes. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes yes. Mr. Schneider <laughs> votes yes. Mr. Swazi? Aye. Mr. Swazi votes aye. Mr. Panetta? Mr. Panetta votes aye. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes aye. Ms. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes aye. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady? Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan? No. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed? Reed is no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? No. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice? No. Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweikert? No. Mr. Schweikert votes no. Ms. Walorski? No. Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood? LaHood votes no. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Wenstrup? No. Dr. Wenstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington? No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson? No. Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes? No. Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker? No. Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn? No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller? Nay. Mrs. Miller votes nay. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman votes aye. The tally will be acknowledged. Mr. Chairman, I have 24 ayes and 18 nays. There being 24 ayes and 18 nays, the ruling of the chair is sustained. Is there any other Mr. amendment? Mr. Chairman. Just a point of... Oh, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Point of personal privilege. Please. I just, something's been chewing on me a little bit. Uh, there was an assertion somehow that the, the title that we're examining uh, had a requirement that employees had a college education. And I, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing in here that has that. I've been looking for it. Is there a citation that somebody, I think Ms. Warlowski made that uh, claim. Is there some material here that I should look at? Because the best of my knowledge, that's not part of this legislation. Hmm. Well, if somebody has that information, I would, that would be appreciated. Because the best of my knowledge, that there is no requirement. Uh, I have talked to staff, and they've confirmed that, uh, that you're correct. Thank you very much. <coughs> Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Chairman, Chairman, I have a amendment. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, is recognized. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thompson is recognized. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from California is reserved a point of order. And we will pass out the gentleman from Pennsylvania's amendment. I hope it's made the inboxes of those who are working remotely. And we are prepared to have Mr. Kelly speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the amendment's actually very simple, and I, I think that we're in a point uh, in, in our country where uh, we, we forget that we actually have a constitution and it needs to be followed, not just the parts we like, but also the parts that sometimes we want to debate. Uh, my amendment is pretty basic. All, we're, all I'm asking is this, let's, let's pump the brakes on this process and, and end this war on religion. 
Now, my colleagues on the other side seem to have forgotten that our nation was founded upon the pursuit of religious liberty. The First Amendment to our Constitution guarantees the right to freedom of religion. The Supreme Court recently affirmed, reaffirmed this right for child welfare providers in Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia. But for some reason, Democrats insist on including language in this bill that expressly prohibits faith-based child care organizations from receiving infrastructure improvement grants. My friends on the other side claim to want to address equity, but instead push secular inequity. And equity is nothing more than something defined as a quality of being fair and impartial and freedom from bias or favoritism. All my amendment would do was strike the, pro, the, the prohibition and allow all high-quality child care providers to be eligible for grants to acquire, construct, renovate, or otherwise physically improve the infrastructure of their child care facilities, including the faith-based providers. By the way, the faith-based providers are the people, if you go back to the very beginning, of who was looking for adoptive care and, and foster care, it was the faith-based community. I don't know why, all of a sudden, if you're a faith-based person in a community, or if you have this, this belief that what you are protecting is something that you need to protect because that is basically one of the foundations of who we are as a people, and you're told that no, 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 you can't be that way and still participate. If we're really talking about taking care of children, if we're really talking about taking on those who no longer have a family that they can be with, and there's a system in place, and it started with the faith-based community. Why would we tell those people now, no, no, you're deeply held faith-based. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And you're going to be excluded from foster care and adoptive care. And in this infrastructure bill, why would we, why would we discriminate and have a bias towards people who are doing what they think is right to take care of a child? Why would we decide that no, unless you believe as we do? See, we're very open-minded until we don't agree with what you think or what you truly believe. You start to wonder, is this the America that has always been there for so many? Is this the America that's always stooped to help those who need care? Is this the America that's willing to take on, and is this a type of faith-based facility who's willing to take on these children and take care of them, especially in a time when there are so many out there. I would just tell you, I just don't figure, I can't figure it out anymore. But I will say this, you have the ability right now, tonight, to look at what's taking place. And this, America, this amendment will protect parents' choices by helping new and existing faith-based child care providers to expand options for parents. Why would we not do that? So what I'm asking everybody on this committee is please take a look, not inside your politics, but inside your policy, inside your, your heart, and inside what America has always been. And let's be open. Let's be open. Let's not discriminate against somebody because they don't believe what we believe. So I, I would just like the, the committee to think about that, and if you have an opportunity, I know, I know when we do these things, it's, it's hard for us to reach across the aisle, and it's hard for us, even when we believe an amendment is, is right, for us to go ahead and say, well, you know, I think it's really good, and I think it probably makes sense, but doggone it, it's not coming from our side, so I'm going to have to vote against it. I'm just going to ask you all to please consider what it is that we're talking about, and that is taking care of adoptive and foster care children in a home that their parents could choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I withdraw my point of order. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I appreciate the gentleman's amendment. Faith-based child care providers expand child care options and provide an important option for parents. Given the horrifying attrition in child care businesses and also in the child care workforce overall, I know we cannot afford to lose a single provider. However, the goal of this legislation is to invest in full-time child care facilities to address the child care crisis. This amendment is a bit of a, a solution in search of a problem. 
We know from the Urban Institute research that most faith-based child care providers rent space in larger faith buildings. So these providers are ineligible for the grant because one can't renovate what one doesn't own. Further, these funds are designed to expand full-time child care facilities. And it's wonderful if a church or religious organization offers child care as part of a service to the community, but the primary role of the organization is religious in nature and not child care. I appreciate my colleagues' desire for these new child care investments to be widely available, and I would hope that he would withdraw his amendment and work with us to help parents find affordable, appropriate child care provided in safe facilities by appropriately compensated workers. The current uh, print doesn't prevent religious providers from getting infrastructure grant or repair. It just says you can't use it if the facility is mainly for religious use. You have, uh, so I would uh, ask my colleague if we could work on that and, and come to a solution that takes care of the needs of all those seeking child care opportunities. Uh, no, Dr. Davis, I, uh, I appreciate your comments, but I will not withdraw. Thanks. Okay. Is there anybody to be heard on the amendment? The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Davis a question. You know, when my kids were young, uh, they attended a daycare facility at the uh, Presbyterian Church downtown in Myrtle Beach. And the facility was in classrooms where they taught Sunday school on Sundays. It was in the main church complex. And there were children of every stripe there, of every race and every income level uh, under your interpretation of that, in that this was in a church building in the classes, in the classroom where the uh, Sunday school was held and, and everybody could come uh, and child care was offered on a very reasonable rate and still is today. Uh, would those people not qualify for these grants, Dr. Davis? And I'll yield, I'll yield to you. Well, the, 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 the activity takes place in the church-owned facility, but in all likelihood, the church is actually renting to a not-for-profit entity. No, the, the, these were offered by the church. These services were offered by the church. Then if the services are offered by the church is outside the jurisdiction of the activity and probably should have a not-for-profit or some other entity operating the child care activity. Why would we exclude the church in that circumstance? That makes absolutely zero sense. If we really want to expand child care, uh, why would we exclude probably one of the largest child care provi providers in the country simply uh, because of their faith? Why would we do that? Well, I think it's the concept of proselytizing that becomes the problem, and I'm not sure we would want to do that. I, 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 I just can't imagine that, that uh, that we, if we, if our goal truly is to provide quality health care, uh, child care to the most children, I don't know why we would craft a law in such a way that would exclude from its benefit one of the largest uh, providers of quality ch child care across this country. That makes absolutely no sense. And you know, this this would be a good thing that we could explore if we had an actual hearing on this bill. You know, it's just one more. Uh, 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 example of of why this this hurried process to ram this thing through on a partisan basis with absolutely zero hearings uh, and and again we don't we only got the details of this bill a couple of days ago and nobody knows the full effects of it and we're going to vote on this blind because we're trying to meet some time schedule set by the uh, speaker it, it's we are doing a disservice to the American people here. 
This entire hearing today and the hearing tomorrow and the hearings next week done with no information, not even having a final bill. And we're here debating details that we don't even know. And spending billions of dollars that we don't have and with no testimony from experts about the effect on, on children. I mean, you know, what this is going to do if we exclude these religious organizations, is it's going to put, it's probably going to put a lot of them out of business, and they're the ones who are providing the cheap, uh, the reasonable price child care today. Why would we do that? With no hearings and with no information. You're doing a disservice to the very people that you say you're trying to help here. This is absurd. I yield back. Will the gentleman yield, Mr. Rice? I yield to the re remainder of my time to Mr. Brady. Well, really, I just wanted to ask you a question. I think this is a wonderful point. I know the focus tonight from both parties is on those single parents and those children, often single moms, but not always. And I think your point is, Mr. Rice, that if there's a good quality child care facility next door at a church or close to where you work, that that is both good and convenient for that parent and for that child. But instead, under this bill, they have to drive across town or take a bus across town to find some facility that may be miles out of the way, making tougher on both the parent and the child because there's fear of proselytizing to a two-year-old? That just doesn't make much sense. We ought to be encouraging that type of convenient, affordable care. Is that true, Mr. Rice? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, or uh, Mr. Ranking Member. I yield back. So the question is on the amendment from the gentleman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And that asks a recorded vote. Brady has requested a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer, no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell abstains. Mr. Pascrell abstains. Mr. Davis? Davis, no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Yes. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell, no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Del Bene? No. Ms. Del Bene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Votes Mr. No. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Hmm? Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? <laughs> Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? <clears throat> Mr. Brady? Brady, aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez, yes. Mr. Nunez votes yes. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan, aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed, aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? 
Mr. Schweikert, Ms. Walorski, Ms. Walorski, Ms. Walorski votes aye. Mr. LaHood? LaHood is yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Aye. Dr. Wenstrup votes aye. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Schweikert? Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Uh, Mr. Pasquale? Well, why don't we just finish the tally? Okay. Mr. Chairman, how do you vote? Uh, no. Mr. Chairman votes no. Mr. Pasquale. Would you speak into the microphone, Bill? I read. Uh, to the language the second time. I'm very concerned because I would love to see uh, church-affiliated institutions provide the care uh, that we're talking about there. But I think that uh, my friend from Chicago, although he didn't say these words, I think is lo looking at whether we do have a proper separation of church and state if there is a rental, for instance, rather than owning uh, yeah. The facility itself. How, how, would you like to change your vote, or are you gonna, how are you going to vote, Bill? I'd vote. No, I, I would vote no. No. Okay. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Pascrell, you're reco recorded as a no. As a no. Mr. Chairman, I have 24 noes and 18 ayes. There being 24 noes and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have uh, a Dr. Amendment. Ferguson? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Thompson. I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order. And the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, is recognized. We'll pass out the amendment. And that's OK. Dr. Ferguson is recognized to speak at his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, instead of thoughtful, flexible investments to boost the supply of high quality, affordable child care, this bill before us includes about $500 million to the Department of Health and Human Services in new administrative dollars to run five new child care grant programs. And while, you know, 500 million or a billion may not seem like a, a lot of money to my friends on the other side of the aisle, especially since we're marking up $3.5 trillion worth of spending here, I think we can do better work with these dollars. Instead of, um, instead of putting this money into the hands of bureaucrats, let's put it into small business owners. According to the Department of Labor, half of child care businesses are minority owned. 93% of child care workers are are women, and 45% are minorities. Recognizing the reality of who provides the care in this country, my amendment would redirect the administrative money from HHS and, and the bureaucrats there to support growth and development of women and minority-owned child care businesses. My amendment also includes no mandates and no new nanny state policies that restrict choices for American families. I think about Miss Natalie Barber's daycare in, in my hometown of West Point, Georgia. 
um, minority-owned business. My son attended there and received an absolutely stunning um, early childhood education. And I think of all of the work that Ms. Nellie and her family and her workers did to provide child care for so many children with not many resources. And I think that money going to someone like Ms. Nellie Barber to, run, to, to, to grow her business would be an, a much better use of these funds than, as opposed to giving it to a bunch of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So with that, I would urge support of my amendment. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn his point of order. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on Dr. Ferguson's amendment? Mr. Horsford. Uh, uh, Mr. Horsford, the gentleman from Nevada, is recognized on Dr. Ferguson's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a question for Dr. Ferguson. So is this for women and minority-owned businesses that offer child care? Yes, it's specific. we would like to see it go to to the um, to child care providers, but so, really, any any minority owned or women owned business. Um, but, but when we, you say, we want to see growth in this in this space, right? And that's what I'm trying to clarify because obviously the underlying bill provides funding to all child care providers, including women and minority owned business businesses that provide child care services. I'm just trying to clarify: is this for businesses other than child care. No, this is, this, is, this is for this bill. Uh, this is for child care. Okay, it's, it's just not clear. It doesn't state that. Well, then it should fit right in with a lot of the, uh, with a lot of the language in, in this, in this uh, overall bill because much of it is not clear. Well, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I, I don't know if staff or someone can clarify, but again, if it's we believe that this is already included, Mr. Horsford. It's included as child care or not child care? Child care. As child care. Yeah. Child care, yeah. Ask Mr. Horsford to restate the question. Do you want to restate the question, Mr. Horsford? Well, my question was, does, is the amendment clear that the funds that would be diverted are for child care specific businesses that are owned by women and people of color. If not, if so, the underlying bill does that because that's what the funding is for, or, or if it's only for women and minority owned businesses that are child care and it's like a set aside, that's different. So as it reads, it says after providers, well, assuming that that is and, and that is child care providers, um, including minority and women-owned women, women owned businesses. Bottom line, the last thing we need is another $500 million going to bureaucrats at HHS. Let's, if, if we're going to spend this money, let's put it in the hands of the folks that can actually provide the service. Mr. Horsford, yours is a technical question, and most child care providers are already owned by women and people of color. Ms. Moore. I, I guess I just want to get in on the questioning. Is this, uh, I'm looking at the language here, is this redundant or is it, it is. just supplanting um, the monies? It's, or is it just It redundant? is redirecting the money from HHS to these minority women-owned businesses. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else who wishes to be heard on the amendment? The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, is recognized. Chairman, I am a strong supporter of minority and women-owned businesses, and I think many of the child care operations are, in fact, owned That's right. by women, probably not as many by minority business operators, but I think essentially the language in the, in, in the print covers the activity, and there is a need for administrative resources. And so I think it's an unnecessary 
amendment, although I have great appreciation for development of minority and women-owned business. Thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I I agree with Mr. Davis. Um, he pretty much <laughs> articulated the argument that I had that if the bulk of business uh, child care providers are women and minorities, um, the money goes to them. So it's a pretty redundant amendment, and I would urge my colleagues to vote no. Right. So, so the question is on the amendment of the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Recorded vote requested. Dr. Ferguson has requested a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? No. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer, no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? I know. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell votes no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? <coughs> yep. Sanchez is no. Ms. Sanchez votes yep, no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Yep, Sewell votes no. Ms. Del Bene? Del Bene votes no. Ms. Del Bene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer? Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Brady? Um, Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes yes. Mr. Nunez votes yes. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes yes. Mr. Buchanan votes yes. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Reed? Reed votes yes. Mr. Reed votes yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Kelly votes yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Yes. Mr. Hearn votes yes. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Uh, Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will call the roll. A tally, please. Mr. Chairman, I have 24 no's and 18 ayes. There being 24 o's, no's and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Are there any other amendments in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Dr. Winstrup. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thompson. I reserve a point of order. Thompson has reserved a point of order. We will pass out Dr. Winstrup's more amendment. Amendment? <clears throat> It's made its way to the inbox, I assume it has, for those of you who are participating remotely. I was 
The gentleman is recognized to speak in his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we sit here today, there are American citizens and Afghan allies who worked with and fought side by side with us for 20 years, stranded behind enemy lines in Afghanistan who we have yet to evacuate. These are people President Biden left stranded. This was not President Trump's plan. President Trump's deadline for withdrawal was May 1, but only if conditions were met. Why? Because that was before the fighting season begins and before the Taliban is at its strongest and most capable. We're seeing the Taliban set up an illegitimate government comprised of terrorists who seek to align with our adversaries and undermine human rights, democracy, and freedom around the world. In fact, four of the five Taliban terrorists President Obama released in exchange for Bo Bergdahl are now in leadership positions. The chaos in Afghanistan was not inevitable. It did not need to happen this way. And this administration knowingly left American citizens and our Afghan allies behind so, they, so that they could meet an arbitrary August 31st deadline, which became the Taliban's red line. While I do believe that we all can carry on and should carry on during chaos, what we should all be doing right now is considering an all-hands-on-deck approach to getting our people and allies home safely. In April, we formed the Honoring Our Promises Working Group. Bipartisan, we sent letters, made phone calls, and had bills passed into law that would expedite the process of getting our SIVs out of the country. We never expected that U.S. citizens and our military assets would be left behind. As a veteran of the Iraq War, I personally had the experience to, to work with and support the Special Immigrant Visa Program, where I supported two Iraqi interpreters. And I know firsthand how they, how they did their job, and as war fighters, we couldn't do our job without theirs. They fight and die with us. One of them, actually both of them, are now physicians and U.S. citizens, but one's a cardiologist and a proud American citizen, and he texted me when the Afghanistan was deteriorating, and he said, it's very, very disheartening. The image of American morality is being tested and is not doing so well so far. We made a promise to these Afghans that we would stand up for them if they fought with us. Our Afghan allies volunteered to serve with the United States because they believed in our cause and our people. Make no mistake, our failure to honor our promises is a black eye in the United States. That's why I'm offering this amendment, to try in one small way to live up to our end of the deal with our Afghan allies. My amendment would expand child care availability under the subtitle to include Afghan SIVs with kids under the age 13 years old. That's it. The underlying bill would provide $27 billion in new child care spending, even though 98 percent of the funds from the last $39 billion spending package remain unspent. Instead of haphazardly debating needs we're not even sure we have, the people we have left behind in Afghanistan is a known crisis that we should be dealing with. In addition to helping our Afghan interpreters, repatriating Americans is an immediate and urgent need, but the mission in Afghanistan is not complete, and it won't be complete until all American citizens are returned or evacuated safely as well as our deserving allies. We have to be better than this. We have to be better than what we are doing. I know getting our SIVs, as well as every single American home, has bipartisan support. Most recently, I led a bipartisan letter with 36 of my House colleagues urging President Biden to commit to evacuating all Americans and Afghan partners, regardless of the arbitrary deadline. Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to submit this letter for the record. So ordered. I'm disappointed that we're here today to talk about adding billions of dollars to address an issue we've already addressed. As well, we shouldn't be focusing on raising taxes on Americans and small businesses to fund a $3.5 trillion bill. I hope my colleagues will recognize the immediate need to help Afghan SIVs, many of whom are still precariously stranded in Afghanistan. I urge adoption of my amendment that does one thing, expands child care availability to include Afghan SIVs with children under 13 who have been fortunate enough to get here as promised to them. With that, I yield back. Gentleman from California, does he insist upon his point of order? He does. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. Mr. Thompson has withdrawn his point of order.
Is there anybody who would be, wish to be heard on the amendment from the gentleman from Ohio? General lady from Wisconsin. I just have a question of the author. Uh, is there anywhere in the uh, substitute that would forbid a provider from providing child care to these Afghan refugee children? What? I would, I would yield for the answer. Yep. And your question in, is in direct? The, yep. in, in the underlying bill, it states increasing child care availability in tribal communities for families with children who have not attained 13 years of age. And that's all it says. Now you're back. So, I would so, so there's nothing in the draft that would forbid an Afghan child from receiving. No, okay. that's right, Ms. Moore. Okay, thank you. You're correct. Uh, I think that the Office of Refugee Resettlement provides various assistance to those newly arrived immigrants. So, I think that this is best left to the resettlement agencies, and my my understanding is that this would be accomplished. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. I'm speak oh, sorry, that. Mr. Brady. Mr. Brady's going to go ahead. Kev. So yeah. thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Let me yield to Dr. Winstrow. Yep. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, important to point out that oftentimes when these types of programs are administered, if it is not spelled out, then they are often left out. And it's important that we make it very clear that they are included uh, so that there isn't the controversy late, later. I think it's a simple thing to add. I think it's appropriate to add. I think it is one way that we can at least say we're trying to honor the promise that we as a nation made and that we make it very clear that we are doing that. Um, it is, uh, I think, a good thing for America's standing in the world that we try to make every effort and make it very clear that we are trying to honor our promises. And this would do just that. I yield back. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment say defy. Aye. Hold on a second. What is it? Does Mr. Davis want to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Davis want to speak. No. We Other than I think you've explained it, Mr. Chairman, uh, it is instinctively an, an assumption or assumed, but that, that HHS would give technical assistance to the establishment or development of any programs that are not currently funded. And so I think I find nothing that would prevent Afghanistanian children from receiving early childhood education or daycare assistance and HHS could indeed work with uh, refugee resettlement to work that out. Question, the question before us is on the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor signify. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Wolarski. I'd like to yield my time to Representative Winthrop. First of all, I'd like, <laughs> with all due respect, use the old adage, you know what happens when you assume and I won't go any further on that, but why would we want to assume when we can make it so clear? Why do we specifically say, why do we specifically say tribal communities? Wouldn't that be assumed as well? This isn't that hard. You got one chance at the end of this day to do the right thing on one of our amendments. And I urge you to do it. I urge you to do it. Don't assume. You know how our government works. Dr. Winstrup? Yes. The gentleman yield for a moment? Yes. I, I know that Dr. Dave is very sincere about this, and I know you are as well. And you just made the case that there's nothing preventing care uh, for these children. But actually, there is. We just had this discussion. If they are trying to obtain care, in a faith-based organization uh, that is providing them this transition help. Under this law, we're forbidding that. 
So there, and my guess is many of these are seeking within their community, in their faith, you know, that transition into the United States and a new life. So my guess is we, uh, this bill, underlying bill, probably cuts off uh, significant avenues of affordable, convenient childcare for these SIV people moving our way. Would that be your understanding, Dr. Winstrup? Uh, yes, it would. And I, I might point out that the administration right now is, is, is seeking funds for those refugees, et cetera, that are coming to the United States. So they might be victims of hurricane, whatever the case may be. This is using existing funds. This would be consistent with what the administration is asking us to do. And I hope you can consider that and just add that language. Please, it's not that hard. It makes sense. And it's consistent with what the administration wants us to do. Question before us is on the amendment from Dr. Winstrup. There is nothing in this bill that limits access to care for any group. I think the resettlement agencies are more than capable of this. We can seek clarification and act upon it if we think it's necessary once we get their advice and consent. With that, Mr. the Chairman, question is. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Dr. Ferguson. Thank you. So, based on your last statement, if there is an Afghan refugee settlement or group and they are providing childcare. In, in an Islamic setting, then they would be eligible for these funds. I think in answer to your question, we need clarification on these issues. Because if you're going to give it to children in an Islamic setting, what's yeah. wrong with giving it to someone in a Catholic setting? We need and seek clarification on the question that Dr. Winstrup and Dr. Ferguson have both offered, and we can do that. So we're, so, we're, so we're going to pass it before we have clarification? No, we're not going to pass it, I don't think. Uh, I, I think that the better opportunity here is to seek clarification on it, and so I would uh, be open to some suggestions on making sure. A thousand Afghan refugees are arriving this weekend in Massachusetts. So I will yield the balance of my time to Dr. Winstrup. So am I to understand, Mr. Chairman, that if we got clarification that it didn't include Afghan SIVs, you're okay with it? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I may ask you a question, because I want to, you said that we need clarification on it. So what I, what I want to hear then is if they clarify that this does not include Afghan SIVs, then you're okay with that. It's, the, the, I understand the technical assistance, Doctor, that you're, you're attempting to make. I feel uncomfortable making a judgment based upon the lack of information that I currently have at the moment. And I would be prepared to assist you if we can find out from the resettlement agencies who are more appropriate in terms of determining what I think is going to be generous American assistance. Well, we can clarify that and we are not. We can clarify that as Congress, to to and we are not. I am yeah. happy to work with you, knowing of your intentions here on this legislation as it makes its way to the floor to see what we might do and to get a good answer to your question. A am I right, sir, that we could clarify that now? If we uh, I, I, I don't know that I could clarify it, no, not right now, but I do think that we can clarify it, yes. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman from Missouri is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to speak on the amendment. Uh, this is why people hate the swamp. The, the duty of members of Congress is to pass laws that clarifies our intent. And so if the current language is not clear, as we've just had a discussion for about 10 minutes, then presenting language 
that clarifies things openly, like what Mr. Winstrup's amendment does, clarifies it. So you don't want something so ambiguous, or is it the fact that Speaker Pelosi hasn't approved Mr. Winstrup's amendment? That may be the case, but our duty as legislators is to make sure what legislation is passed is clarified. And if an amendment clarifies it, that is following the duty of what we're supposed to do. But I'm sure that this committee's priority is to make sure anything a Republican suggests does not get adopted today. Yield back. Thank the gentleman. The question is on the amendment offered by Dr. Winstrup. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. I ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Brady has asked for a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? No. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? N Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins? Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Higgins Ms. votes no. Higgins votes Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Delbene? No. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? No. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady, aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez, aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Yes. Mr. Buchanan votes yes. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Reed? Reed, yes. Mr. Reed votes yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Kelly votes yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert votes aye. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Yes. Mr. LaHood votes yes. Dr. Wenstrup? Oh, yes. M Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Will the clerk report the tally? Mr. Chairman, I have 24 nays and 18 ayes. There being 24 uh, nays and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Hearing none. Where are we here, Daniel? Hmm. If there are no further amendments, the question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. Now let me recognize Mr. Thompson for the purpose of offering a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee favorably report Subtitle C, Budget Reconciliation Legislative Recommendations Relating to Child Care Access and Equity, as amended to the Committee on Budget. The question is on transmitting the bill, Subtitle C, as amended to the House Committee on the Budget. Members are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and the subtitle C is amended as order transmitted to the House Committee on the Budget. Mr. Chairman, a recorded vote. Gentlemen from Texas, Mr. Brady is recognized and requests a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Aye. Mr. Doggett votes aye. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, aye. Mr. Thompson votes aye. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Larson votes yes. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer, aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Kind? Kind, aye. Mr. Kind votes aye. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, yes. Mr. Pascrell votes yes. Mr. Davis? Davis votes aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes aye. Ms. Sanchez votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, yes. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes yes. Ms. Sewell votes yes. Ms. Delbene? Yes. Ms. Delbene votes yes. Ms. Chu? Chu votes yes. Ms. Chu votes yes. Ms. Moore? Ms. Moore votes aye. Ms. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kildee? Yes. Kildee votes yes. Mr. Kildee votes yes. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Mr. Byer votes aye. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes aye. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes aye. Mr. Schneider votes aye. Mr. Swazi? Yes. Mr. Swazi votes yes. Mr. Panetta? Mr. Panetta votes yes. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez aye. Mr. Gomez votes aye. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes aye. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes A. Ms. Plaskett votes aye. Mr. Brady? Yeah, that was, yeah, that's, that's... Brady, no. Mr. Brady votes no. Mr. Nunez? Nunez, no. Mr. Nunez votes no. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan, no. Mr. Buchanan votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of, Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes no. Mr. Reed? Reed, no. Mr. Reed votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Smith of Missouri? No. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes no. Mr. Rice? No. Mr. Rice votes no. Mr. Schweikert? No. Mr. Schweikert votes no. Ms. Walorski? Ms. Walorski? No. Ms. Walorski votes no. Mr. LaHood? No. Mr. LaHood votes no. Dr. Wenstrup? No. Dr. Wenstrup votes no. Mr. Arrington? No. Mr. Arrington votes no. Dr. Ferguson? Dr. Ferguson votes no. Mr. Estes? No. Mr. Estes votes no. Mr. Smucker? No. Mr. Smucker votes no. Mr. Hearn? No. Mr. Hearn votes no. Mrs. Miller? No. Mrs. Miller votes no. Mr. Boyle? Uh, you, you got to ride home? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes aye. Yeah, I The clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have 23 ayes and 19 noes. There being 23 ayes and 19 noes, the motion is agreed, and subtitle C is amended as order transmitted to the House Committee on the Budget. Without objection, staff are authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the committee print, and members have two additional days to file with the committee clerk supplemental, additional, or dissenting minority views. I want to tell the uh, committee that we intend to bring the gavel down promptly at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and I'm ever so hopeful that we can conclude our work early in the afternoon. The committee stands in recess until Friday, September 10th at 10 a.m. Thank you, Kevin. That was good. Thank you.